modules. Um, specifically, we're going to be talking about um, <coughs> modules and um, how they work, how you should structure your application um, with modules to take advantage of the modular architecture in Zen Framework 2. Also, some of the things like configuration loading, which is um, a big kind of headache for those that are learning Zen Framework 2. That's one of the more complex things. You're going to understand it really well um, by the end of this. There is a talk, I believe, tomorrow morning called like Introduction to Modules in Zen Framework 2. Um, it might be the second day. I'm not sure which one's which. Don't go to the modules talk, um, the Zen Framework 2 modules talk. If you're here, you're going to get everything that will be in that talk and much more. So don't go to that talk. Find something more interesting uh, to do. So all right, we'll go ahead and um, get started. Perfect, yeah, so it's the one tomorrow at 11.30. I have another talk the next day um, about building a maintainable ZF2 application. That will not overlap with this at all. So if you want to go to that one, it's uh, going to be a good talk. All right, so to introduce myself, I'm Evan Corey. Um, if you don't know me, I go uh, by the name Evan.pro online, and batteries are dead in this. That's useful. Um, I'm a ZF2 core contributor. I wrote the module manager in Zen Framework 2. So if you've been using Zen Framework 2 and have written uh, modules in Zen Framework 2, you can thank me. I've got triple A's here somewhere. Got to find them. Sorry. The battery meter on this uh, clicker lies when you turn it on. Yeah, I got two bars for four minutes. All right. So um, I'm also on the Zen Framework 2 community review team. And that means that if you do any pull requests or file any issues with Zen Framework 2, I'm going to be one of the guys that's going to tell you that you need to write unit tests for that pull request before we merge it. Um, I'm on the Zen Framework 2 Education Advisory Board. So if you have any plans to get certified for Zen Framework 2 with the new Zen Framework 2 certification exam that just was announced, I wrote a lot of the questions on that test. So if you have questions. I'm limited to what I can tell you, but I can give you um, some hints and pointers as to what you should really be studying. Um, I'm a speaker, obviously. I go around to these conferences. I like to spread the good news about Zen Framework 2. <laughs> um, I'm a training instructor, so if you sign up for Zen for the ZF2 training, I'm probably going to be the one that's going to teach that class. And I really like dogs, and I like aviation. So outside of computers, I have a couple interests. Um, that's about it, though. Those are my dogs, uh, two Border Collies. Well, she's like a Border Collie mix or something. We're not sure. Um, so yeah, I miss my dogs. You'll probably know that by the end of this. I run a company called Rove. You may have seen us on the sponsors list. Um, I promise this is not like a sponsor talk or anything. I just really like Zen Framework 2. Uh, I work with all those ugly guys. And basically, um, these are like the core contributors to Zen Framework 2 that aren't the Zen team. So like everybody else, I just hired them. Um, <laughs> and, and started a company. And we basically um, help people with their projects, help companies with their projects, do consulting, end-to-end -end development, whatever. That's it. That's pretty much the end of my commercial spiel. Um, I have to give a disclaimer. Uh, if the internet works and we can pull this off, um, by the end of this tutorial, we should have a working multiplayer um, game. And the game is Cards Against Humanity. Does everybody know that game? Yeah, I see some nods, some head shake. Um, cards Against Humanity is a card game that's normally played with physical cards. I made an online version in Zen Framework 2. Some of the cards are, um, well, the point of the game is to offend people, basically. So um, as far as uh, what uh, you might see, this is a little. I don't know if you can read these, but um, there's, there's some, there's some uh, interesting ones. So if you're uh, easily offended, I apologize. Just yeah, try to, huh? Yeah, this is actually, they, if you go to Cards Against Humanity's website, they have this. And it's like this JavaScript SVG thing. And I just ripped it straight off their site and put it on my slide. Um, so yeah, I blatantly 
install that. All right. So the agenda for today is we're going to talk about an introduction to Zen Framework 2, just kind of a high level um, overview of the architecture. And um, how many people in here have already been using Zen Framework 2 or are already using Zen Framework 2? About half. How many are planning to use Zen Framework 2 in a future project? The rest of you? OK. How many use Zen Framework 1? OK. Quite a few of you. Cool. So um, I'm going to do a high level overview. If you've been using Zen Framework 2, you might be familiar with some of these things. Um, as someone who built a lot of the internals of the framework, I can give you some insight into why we made some of these decisions. And I'm hoping to kind of um, enlighten you as far as those things go. If you have any questions as we go along, please just feel free to ask. Um, and I'll be more than happy to answer them. I've got Alan here in the front. He's my. Uh, Backup plan, if nobody asks questions, he has a bunch of uh, questions for me, apparently. So we'll get questions one way or another. Uh, then we're going to talk about modules. That's my favorite topic. That's kind of the focus of this um, tutorial. And we're going to talk about configuration, because um, as much as it kind of sucks, there's a lot of arrays and config in Z2. Uh, you've got to know it and not know how it works in order to take advantage of it and um, really appreciate how cool uh, the configuration layer in ZF2 is. And then I want to focus a bit on services and the service manager and um, really how to make that uh, work to your advantage when making a modular application. And then we're going to obviously try it. So we're going to be doing some exercises throughout the, the thing. So Zen Framework 2. Um, Zen Framework 2 is, is good, obviously, right? You're all using it. You all like it. Um, we made a lot of really good changes. We learned a lot from Zen Framework 1, uh, made a lot of good changes for Zen Framework 2. Um, it's a really solid, solid framework. This always comes up every time I give a talk, so I decided I had to add a slide. Zen Framework 3 is on the horizon, and I know that's really scary, especially for those of you who have just made an enormous leap from Zen Framework 1 to Zen Framework 2. Um, don't be afraid of this. This is not going to be a repeat of that. This is going to be an incremental update. It's just a few backwards compatibility breaks that we want to make. And we have a very strict policy about not breaking backwards compatibility in a minor version. So that's it. We're just going to tick over to 3 when we want to get those backwards compatibility breaks in. There's not going to be, huh? 2 to 3. Um, maybe not scripts. It depends on you know how scriptable the things end up being. but. Um, at the very least, there will be a um, very simple guide on just the couple things you might need to change. And I have a feeling that a lot of them are going to be edge case things that probably won't even apply to a lot of applications. So you may not even have to worry about it. Um, I can give you a couple hints. Like the service manager is probably going to become case sensitive. Um, right now, we normalize service names. We uh, convert them all to lowercase, strip some characters out. Um, that's probably going to go away. So if you already treat your service names as case sensitive, that's a change that won't even affect you. Um, so just some things like that. It's going to have a completely new router, um, but it's going to be backwards compatible compatible with the uh, ZF2 router. And that's just uh, Ben Scholzen, who wrote the router, want, wanted to uh, well, rewrite the router, I guess. All right. So some key features about Zen Framework 2. If you uh, don't know me uh, from online, I am pretty well known for hating the word manager in software development in general. It's just a really, really poor suffix. And unfortunately, Zen Framework loves the suffix manager. It is everywhere. Everything's a manager in Zen Framework 2. In fact, like everything's a manager. Um, so. As far as like key features, what we did with Zen Framework 2 is, first of all, everything is a module. In Zen Framework 1, that wasn't necessarily the case. You could just start building an MVC application and throw controllers in. It didn't necessarily need to be part of a module. Now, you have to have a module. It doesn't really make sense um, not to have a module. And it's Zen Module Manager that makes that happen. I did not name that component Zen Module Manager. I named it Zen Module, just for the record. Um, Zen module. It's not a manager, really. All it does is load modules, really. Um, 
I actually did. I named it Zen Module, and somebody came in and argued, and I tried to argue back, and I lost. So maybe I need to work on becoming more persuasive. Eh, yeah, kind of. We have one particular listener that manages configuration, yeah. All right, and in Zen Framework 2, there's a big focus on inversion of control. And that is a big change and something that you kind of have to adjust your mind, think, your mode of thinking from Zen Framework 1. Um, we use the service manager a lot. There's also a component called Zen DI. If you are using it, you should stop and try to use Zen Service Manager. Um, if you're not using Zen DI, just pretend Zen DI doesn't exist. Um, it, was, it was a mistake is what it was. Um, Really what happened is ZenDI is a really good component. It's a really good dependency injection framework. If you go and look at all the dependency injection frameworks. The problem is that PHP as a language is not ready for those types of behaviors, those, those type, that type of functionality. And um, the performance for all the reflection and stuff that it has to do to make that work is just really not there in PHP. So uh, Ralph built the service manager. It accomplishes all the same things, solves all the same problems, and does it in a more explicit way. And the performance is a million, million times better. Um, and then it is event-driven Zen Framework 2. And we're going to talk a bit about events today. And events are a really powerful concept. They allow you to keep your code clean. They're like the best tool that you can have for keeping code clean. Um, if you haven't heard of the, the concept of separation of concerns, a lot of people have heard that term, but aren't really sure exactly how it applies. Um, imagine you have some controller, and the controller is for like creating a post or something. If you have an action, that action method that creates that post, and it, in that action method, the body of that method, there's any code that does something besides creating a post, that is not code that should be in that controller. If it is checking whether they're logged in, if it is logging something to a file or sending an email or any of those types of things, those are not relevant to creating a post. So that's a separation of concerns. You should have another class whose responsibility is to do those things. And the event manager allows you to do that. You can, when certain actions happen, fire an event. You can have listeners that are responsible for very distinct things that handle um, those types of things. So you can have this nice, pristine, clean code and not have to just keep bulking up your, your action methods or your, your mapper methods or whatever. So this is kind of what the event-driven architecture uh, looks like in Zen Framework 2. This is actually internal when you go to execute um, an action or, or actually just send a request to a ZF2 application. Um, everything's just a sequence of events. So if you go and look at the actual framework code, you go to Zen MVC application and look at the code, there's not a lot going on there. It's actually just a few lines of code that basically says, trigger bootstrap, trigger route, trigger dispatch. It just fires a few events. All the code that does the meat of the work is implemented as listeners to those events. So um, that's, that's what it looks like. It's just event, 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 and the listeners are, are reacting to those events. So this is the, uh, the whole MVC process. Hopefully that's big enough for everybody in the room. And how it looks in Zen Framework 2. This is pretty important to understand, um, especially the modules part, which is, I think, something that a lot of people um, kind of overlook. So when a request comes into a Zen Framework 2 application, the very, very first thing that ZF2 does is initialize the modules. It can't do anything else before it initializes the modules. They are the key um, piece of information for Zen Framework 2 to do everything else. How can you match a route if you haven't loaded the modules which contain the routes? How can you dispatch a controller if you haven't loaded the modules? So everything depends on the modules being loaded. So that's step one, is modules load. And it loads every module for every request. And that is a very lightweight process. So it's really just uh, a, an auto load of one single class file. Um, optionally a couple method calls on that class but nothing else and so you can have hundreds of modules without really seeing any performance um, degrade I can't say I can't talk today your performance will not decrease with a large number of modules so after the modules are loaded that's when it can actually start to bootstrap things so it triggers a bootstrap event and there's a couple things that get set up by the framework there um, but Mainly, that bootstrap event's there for you. 
to um, do whatever you need to do, whether you need to attach to other events, whether you need to um, do some kind of a check or something like that um, before the rest of the application gets ran or dispatched, that, that bootstrap event really exists for you. Then the application runs, and this is what we call dispatching. So we've been app application class, and we're going to kind of dig into some code a little bit. Um, but the application class fires a dispatch event. This confuses a lot of people. If you start playing with events in Zen Framework 2, inevitably you're probably going to attach to the dispatch event. And that can be really, really confusing because there are, there's not just one dispatch event in Zen Framework 2. There's actually two distinct dispatch events. The MVC application class fires a dispatch event. The listener to that will go and get the controller and call the dispatch method on the controller. If you go and look at the dispatch method in the abstract controllers that Zen Framework 2 ships with, guess what it does? It gets an event manager and triggers an event called dispatch. So you have a dispatch event who has a listener that loads a controller, runs a method that triggers a dispatch event. Um, that took me a while to understand. I actually was working on the framework reviewing this code and didn't even understand what was going on, why sometimes this event would get thrown at one point and then other times it would be thrown at another point. That was really confusing. Um, so be aware of that. You have the application's dispatch event and the controller's dispatch event, and they're very distinct things. Um, huh? Completely separated, yeah. Um, the controller dispatch event fires as the result of the application's dispatch event. Um, so, but as far as you know, the code and everything's concerned, they're completely distinct things. I need to get my laser pointer working. I'll find my triple A's real quick. This is gonna kill me. Yes. So we're gonna. I'm gonna talk about that here in, in a second. Where did I stick those? I literally just put them in my pocket in the hotel room. Weird. Oh, I know where I put them. All right. Sorry. My memory is about that of a goldfish. Yay. Okay. So, all right. Um, yeah, so we have the application being ran there. That's, you can think of that as the, the application's dispatch event. Um, a listener loads the controller, your controller, and it dispatches your controller, which is firing another dispatch event. And you can, when you attach to the dispatch event, um, there's something called identifiers, which I'm going to talk a little bit about later. Um, they'll let you choose specifically which dispatch event you're, you're attaching to. Um, this is pretty much where all of your application is going to live. This is where you are going to be doing all your work, um, your controller actions and all that stuff, um, but more importantly, your business logic, which should not be in your controllers, by the way. Go to my talk on, uh, on the last day. I'll talk about that. Um, so your action is ran, your business logic happens, data gets passed back to the view, and that generates uh, ultimately a response. And that response that you get back is sent to the browser. And that's really the whole cycle. It's not much different than any other MVC framework. Um, but the, the good thing to know from this is that modules are always loaded first. Bootstrap event is something that you can attach to yourself. There are two dispatch events. So those are the, the important things to take away from that. The skeleton application, I th think probably most people in here are pretty familiar with it then since everybody said that they've been using Zen Framework 2. It's really easy to get started with. You can just clone it, use Composer to uh, grab the framework and stuff, and you're ready to go. Uh, you can even technically clone it recursively um, from GitHub, and it'll actually load ZF2 and everything, because we've got Git submodules set up. And it has everything you need to, you need to get started with Zen Framework 2. It's got a sample controller, it's got an application module that's set up. But the important thing to know is that the skeleton application is just more of, it's, it's meant to be used as a starting point for your application, but it's also just an example. Um, nothing in the skeleton application is a rule or enforced by the framework in any way, shape, or form. In fact, the framework knows nothing about the directory structure of the skeleton application, um, the way that those directories are 
laid out is completely defined within the skeleton application, not the framework. That's a big difference from Zen Framework 1, which had a ton of hard-coded assumptions about directory names and paths, and there's a resource autoloader that assumed everything was lowercase and plural when you have you know, your, your models and controllers and stuff. Um, that's all gone now. We have no assumptions about paths in Zen Framework 2. So that's what you get. That's actually a little bit old. Um, it's been updated a bit since then, but that's the skeleton application. The directory structure, like I said, completely user-defined in user land. So um, I'm going to kind of walk through these directories. You may be familiar with them, but I want to kind of um, also explain the uh, justifications behind a lot of this. So at the top level, the config directory is, is an important one that you're going to live in a lot um, and be doing a lot of work in. This projector is killing me. It's like blowing really hot air. I can walk over here for a little bit. Uh, so the config directory is where you're going to be doing a lot of, um, obviously, your configuration, right? Underneath the configuration directory, there's this autoload directory. And the autoload config files are um, they're config files that, based on a pattern, are going to be loaded by the framework automatically. And we put that there just as a convenience method for module authors to be able to um, distribute config files that could just be dropped in to this autoload directory and just kind of work. That's one reason. And also, it gives you a good place to put application level configuration. Um, you may have configuration that doesn't apply to one specific module, like a database connection might be used by all your modules, right? So you can define that in like a, a global or a local config file. And that's the next thing, is in your autoload directory, by default we have it set up to load anything that ends in global.php and local.php. And who knows the, the reason that you're supposed to use um, one over the other. Does anybody know? So yeah, you want to ignore the local config files from, from your repository. That's correct. Um, what about like a, an example of what you would put in local versus uh, global? Passwords. Passwords. Perfect. Um, also, anything that is just going to change from environment to environment. So yeah, password's a good example, <coughs> but also maybe log paths, maybe um, Adapters you may on your, you know, continuous integration server, Jenkins or something, um, not use a real uh, email transport. You might use a file email transport that just writes to a file instead of actually sends out emails. Um, things like that. So those might be candidates to go into a local config file that you want to change um, between environments. That's a big difference from Zen Framework One, which had one gigantic config file with sections for each environment that you had. Um, you can still accomplish that same effect if you want to in Zen Framework 2, but it's just really not recommended. Um, I'm the one who kind of came up with the local and global config file thing, and um, it's actually a practice that spawned out of me using Zen Framework 1 and running into these problems like having database credentials checked in and stuff like that. So I decided, you know, there, there needs to be a better way to handle this. Yep. Mm -hmm. Two. Yeah, so um, like you said, the local config files aren't actually checked in, right? So they're going to exist on each environment. And that's where they're going to live. Um, now, there's a whole other subject to this, which is your deployment and how do you actually get those local values on each you know, environment. Where do you store them? Do you have a separate repository for your sysadmins? Do you use template files and then write those values in? There's a lot of ways to solve these problems. Um, but the, the basic concept um, is that you can have an unlimited number of environments. You can have you know, testing, staging, development. Um, production, but those just all are the local config files um, on each environment. What? Mm -hmm. 
Um, you can do that. So that's actually the trick um, that allows you to kind of do the ZF1 style, is you can adjust this pattern. And I've got a whole slide dedicated to showing that trick. But um, the what I would generally recommend, if you want to be able, at a glance, to see like which values need to be set in staging, which values need to be set in production, without actually having like the password sitting there, um, what you can do is you could have like yeah like a production dot local dot php or something, and then actually I'd put dot dist, like a, a, it's a distribution file, and it would just kind of have dummy values, not the real values necessarily, but it shows you which ones need to be set in that environment. Um, and if they're sensitive ones, you really just don't want those sitting in your source code control. So you don't want you know, your production database passwords and stuff. So um, I hope that kind of answers that question. But I'm going to show you the, the other tricks that you can do for um, loading multiple environments, like in Framework 1, uh, which is just more comfortable for some people. Um, so the next config file here, after we get out of the auto load directory, is this application.config file. Application.config.php is a special configuration file. All the configuration in Zen Framework 2, anywhere you can define configuration, whether it be in your module, your git config method, it be in this auto load directory, um, there are some other special methods in your modules that can define configuration. All that gets merged into one gigantic array by the framework. The exception is application.config.php. It does not get merged in with that. And the reason for that is that the very first thing the framework does is include this file, basically, before it does anything else. And that file defines which modules am I going to load and where am I going to load them from. It has a couple other things, but that, that's the main purpose of that configuration file. And that needs to be defined before um, it can actually really go any further. And in fact, there's also some key information in this file about the directory structure overall. Um, this auto load directory and the pattern of files that it loads are actually defined right here. So that's actually how that's bootstrapped. The framework doesn't know about an auto load directory. You told it in this config file where to find those. Um, the, this module directory where you place all of your modules, also defined in application.config. Vendor, also defined there. All those things are defined in the application.config. And index.php is where you define where the, that config file is. So everything is kind of bootstrapped and self-contained within the skeleton app. The module directory and this vendor directory, they're next to each other. I know with the split view, it's hard to see the hierarchy. Um, they are functionally identical. So you could move this application directory over to vendor. It would still work. Um, the distinction is an organizational thing, right? If you're installing third-party modules from GitHub, whatever, vendor is a really good place to put those. If you are solving the problem for your specific application, then put your module under module. Um, like I said, that's defined in application.config.php, though. So you can come up with your own if you don't like that convention. Um, it's up to you. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's that vendor directory is actually, um, I think I've got, yeah, OK. So here's application.config.php. Um, you define your array of modules that you want to load, right? You also, down here, define module paths. And this is just the places that it should go looking for those modules. Um, so they're just in a list next to each other. They Behavior-wise, they're, they're identical to the framework. Yeah, so that, that's another thing, is if you're using Composer, we have composer.json, um, or Composer by default, actually, um, is set to use a directory called vendor in the root. So also, Composer will just in automatically start installing crap under here. Um, so that's, that kind of differentiates them, I guess. But to the framework itself, they're identical um, for all intents and purposes. So. Um, that's your module paths. The module paths work just like the PHP include path. So it's just going to, for each of these modules, go search in that order um, to find them. The only exception is that if you are using Composer to install a module, um, Composer's autoloader comes first. So Composer will actually say, actually, hey, don't worry, Zen Framework. You don't need to go find that module. I've got it. It's already, it's already taken care of. 
um, and it'll get it loaded first. And in fact, you could, if you're using Composer entirely, you could get rid of this module paths, and it would still work because mod Zen Framework at that point wouldn't even be being used to load the modules. It just is auto loading them from Composer. Um, right here, config glob paths. That's that pattern um, that is defined for loading those global and local config files, and it's subtle, but this pattern is actually important. It's strategic. Um, if you're not familiar with glob patterns, basically you have curly braces, right? And the curly braces are a list separated by commas. That's it. That's really all there is to the glob pattern. And then you have star for wildcard. This first list here is a list of nothing. There's literally nothing before the comma. And star dot. So it's saying it can either be nothing or um, something with a dot following it. And then after that, we have global, comma, local. So it's going to match anything that starts with, you know, like foo.global.php or just global.php. Um, but the important distinction here is this order. Because what this glob pattern is going to give back when we run it through a PHP function creatively called glob is an array of directories, or an array of files that match it. And the order of the, that array of those files is going to be determined by this. So it's actually going to list all the global ones first in that array, and then all the local ones second in that array. And the reason that that's important, we're going to be talking a lot about config merging later. But basically, we start with an empty array, and we load each one, and we merge each one into that array as we go along. And if you have values that conflict or override other values, that's going to be important in the order that they were um, loaded in. So you might have a global config file that defines uh, a default log path or something. And you might have a local one on your staging server that defines you know, a separate log path that's you know, somewhere else on that particular server. And that would override it. So um, that's your application config. Remember that this whole array does not get merged with anything else. It's consumed immediately. So um, this is index.php from the skeleton. It has grown a few more lines now because one of my developers found a bug in the PHP built-in web server, so there's an extra if statement. But this is the gist of it. Um, the first thing we do is we change the directory um, of PHP, the working directory of PHP. Everybody remember the application underscore path constant from ZF1 that used ZF1? If you didn't use ZF1, it had a constant that was set first thing, um, which is the path, the full path to where the ZF1 application lived. In Zen Framework 2, we realized like, we don't need that. That's actually really, really pointless. Um, and so to simplify everything, we just simply change the working directory of PHP immediately um, to the application's root path. So then anywhere you're defining paths to things, it can just be relative from the root, which is a really beautiful thing. Um, so you can see here when we do an include, we just say config slash app. We don't have to go slash dot dot slash out of the public directory like you would um, normally, because index.php lives in public. So we get rid of that dot dot slash problem that, that exists everywhere. Um, I, I'm calling your application root like where these directories live, like where public is, where config is, data. Those are all um, at the top level of your application. You like your V hosts, like top level. And then underneath that, you would have a public. That would be like your, your document root, possibly. Um, we don't really have a term for it in ZF2 because it's not like referenced by the code, really, um, ever. Uh, the document root, like the public directory, we basically just get rid of it right here. We just say, like, you know, move up a directory. Now pretend you just started from there. Um, if you want to get in there, you can just do dot slash public from anywhere, and that'll always work. Um, so init autoloader just has some boilerplate for getting the autoloading all set up. But you can see here that this is really the, one of the first things it does is include that application config. It's consumed immediately. It's not merged with anything. Um, and that's pretty much all you have to do right there to, to run a, a ZF2 application. It's really simple. All right. So um, we talked about config. We talked about the autoload directory, application config. Uh, we also shipped the skeleton with the data directory. 
And that is uh, kind of just a subtle hint to you that if you have modules and you need to do something like write cache or write logs or whatever, you just ha need to write something somewhere, um, don't do it into your modules directory. The module directory should just kind of stay pristine in a, in a clean state from you know, whatever release it was or version it was. It shouldn't be modified by itself. It shouldn't be written to. Um, do that at, outside of that, at the application uh, level or at somewhere else on the server. Don't do it in the modules directory itself. Think of like, um, best comparison I can make is like the programs file, or program files directory on Windows maybe. Um, you wouldn't expect a, a program to write within that directory of itself. It writes into your user profile data somewhere else on the, the computer. Same kind of concept. Um, and that pretty much covers everything. The public directory is um, exactly what you think. It, this is the, the index.php is the only file that's really relevant to the framework. Everything else is just your static assets. Um, and that's pretty much it. So um, the first exercise that we have uh, to do, I'm going to probably just do it on screen. You can try to follow along um, if you want. But uh, I'm just going to do it uh, on screen so that, because there are some people that don't have laptops and stuff. So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to start from the skeleton application. And, and throughout this, we're just kind of going to evolve it a little bit. Um, the first thing we're going to do is install and enable a module called Zen Developer Tools. Who's used Zen Developer Tools already? Anybody? Two of you? Three of you? OK. Um, so, we're going to install that. I just like to always um, show people that so that if you don't know exists, um, be a resource for you. Uh, then we're going to install Fly Contact. Fly Contact is a really, really simple module um, written by Matthew Weirofini, who is the lead for Zen Framework 2. Uh, it just adds a contact form to your website, slash contact, name, email, message. Uh, but then we're going to customize the CAPTCHA that that module ships with. And we're going to do that without touching the module's code in any way, shape, or form. So. Um, that's what we're going to do is this kind of first exercise here. So if you um, copied the zip, there should be a skeleton in there. And um, you should just be able to get it running. And so I've got it here, skeleton.dev, uh, already up and running. And then we have that modules directory that uh, I think it's called local modules. Uh, all right, so let me open up. Workspace here. All right, and so we've got these are all the modules that we're going to be using throughout the uh, the day here. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to install Zen Developer Tools and Fly Contact. So um, the easiest way to do that would just be to copy them into the vendor directory. Um, but you can kind of get creative because remember I told you you've got that module paths array, so you could actually add that. Um, modules local directory to be one of your module paths if you wanted to, instead of moving the modules around. So um, it's up to you how you want to actually enable them. Um, so I'm going to open up my thing. So I've got the skeleton here. And I'm just going to open up my config directory, application.config. And I'm going to do what I said. I'm going to add dot dot slash, um, what was it called? modules dash local. So this is relative. So obviously, this only works if your skeleton and that local modules directory are next to each other. Um, if not, just copy those two folders into your vendor directory, and it'll still work the same. So you can see here, I've got um, the skeleton. And next to it, I've got modules local. You can ignore that. That's my slides. Um, uh, it should be on that USB drive. They should just be. There should be two directories: the skeleton and the modules local. Um, you you got it right. The USB drive. You got it. Cool. Okay. So um, as you can see, I've got them next to each other. So that's why I can do this dot dot slash uh, modules local. And remember, because that chdir call in index.php, that's why these local paths um, or these relative paths work. Um, in fact, we don't actually need dot .slash. Um, I added the, the dot .slash just to make it a little bit more clear that it's a path. Um, 
But if you took away dot slash, that would those two would actually still work. Uh, all right, so that should get the paths working, but we need to actually also enable the module itself. Um, and that's what we do. We do that by adding it to this array. So if you just drop a module into vendor, it's not going to magically turn on. You got to enable it in application.config.php. That was a debate, and I fought against automatically turning on modules and automatically scanning the directory for them. Um, I think it should be an explicit action by the developer to turn on a module. Um, otherwise, you're opening up to a lot of easy mistakes. So we're just going to add Zen Developer Tools there. <laughs> and if you look in the autoload directory of um, the autoload directory that with the skeleton, I've actually already put Zen Developer Tools .local, um, in there. You should have it. If you don't, it's a dist file in the, the um, config directory of the module itself, but you should have it since I'm using the same copy from that zip file. Um, and I just basically copied this from Zen Developer Tools. It, it was a dist file that it ships, and it, it says in the readme to just drop it into your autoload directory. So that's the only two things we've did. You can see on the left I've got uh, change tracking. So if you're curious at any point what I've changed, you can see. Uh, we just added Zen Developer Tools. We added modules local. Um, if we go back to our project and refresh, we now have this handy dandy little thing here on the bottom. And it's just a floating bar that has a bunch of information. Um, here's how many milliseconds the request took, how much memory it took. Um, there's a config. If you actually roll over um, the configuration, there's, you know, it shows you all the merge config here. Um, it's pretty printed because I have xdebug. If you don't have xdebug on your local machine, Install and enable xdebug. It will save your life when working with Zen Framework 2, especially if you var dump anything with the service manager in it. Has anybody done that without xdebug? Crashed the browser? Yeah. So if you, it, the service manager actually contains itself as a service, and so if you var dump it, it just recursively var dumps forever and just consumes all the memory in your browser and crashes everything. So um, xdebug has like a nesting limit on var dump and solves that problem very easily. Xdebug, yeah, by Derek Reathens. It's a PHP extension. Uh, very, very useful. You will wonder how on earth you did anything before installing Xdebug. All right, so, um, and that's why mine looks pretty. You can see here it's like got kind of colors and stuff. Xdebug does that. That's a feature of it. Um, so down here you see we, we just rolled over config. This is the merged config of everything. Your modules config, those autoload config files, all of that just smashed into one big array. Uh, also shows the application config. Uh, obviously, is a distinct, separate configuration here. So we've got our, that modules array, the module paths, um, the glob paths, and so on. Uh, and so you can see those are two distinct things. It also has this information on, on the request, the method that was used, the view template that was used, a um, bunch of stuff like that. And additionally, it has this little database thing. Um, for database profiling. So if you are doing ZenDB stuff and you're doing a bunch of queries, it'll show you all the queries, the total amount of time spent on each query, all that stuff. But it won't work out of the box. Um, you need to install um, a module that was written by one of my developers called like BJY Profiler or something. Um, it's a dependency because, well, I don't know why it never got baked into the developer tools. So just <laughs> it's, you have to install a second module to actually get database profiling. So that's Zen Developer Tools. Um, yeah, so this does, the profiling for this is all ZenDB. I don't know whether or not, I think there is, is some kind of a plugin somewhere for Doctrine. You'd have to search for it. I, I just vaguely remember hearing somebody talk about it, but I've never actually seen it. All right, so that's Zen Developer Tools. Uh, very useful for debugging configuration without having to do var dumps and stuff. Um, doing really, really rough performance uh, tweaks and stuff. You can just kind of, I, I don't, I wouldn't use this for any real benchmarking, the little millisecond counter. It's, it's as accurate as it can be, but it's not perfectly accurate. Um, and additionally, uh, you're just, you're not going to see a lot of consistency because of a bunch of different things in your local environment, especially if you're using like Vagrant or something. Um, but 
I like to just have that there while I'm developing so I can see if like over time, if, if you see it always at 68 milliseconds and then over time you make a few changes one week and you're up to like 170 milliseconds, you can think like, okay, what, what did I do? Maybe, maybe I'm doing stuff a little bit too heavy here. Um, so for like high level, just kind of getting a feel of what you've done to your application, it can be useful. But don't like be like, oh yeah, I just saved two milliseconds. Like that's <laughs> not, not the kind of benchmark that you want to use for that. Um, cool, so that's, that's about it for Zen developer tools. I just mainly put that there as one, practice installing modules, but two, to be aware of Zen developer tools and that it exists. So um, the next thing we're going to do is install um, Fly Contact, the contact module. So um, same idea. If you've got your module path already set up, you can just uh, enable Fly Contact like that. And if it worked, which I don't know whether or not it does out of the box, if you go to slash contact, ooh, nice, um, you should either get a fatal error or a um, contact form. And that's going to depend on your configuration. But one second, let me see uh, what I did wrong here. I just upgraded PHP and I do something weird on my configuration. Okay, um, so you should get like a, a contact form, probably something like this. Uh, and literally all I did was enable a module and I've got a contact form on my site. That's it's kind of cool. It's not like the most impressive example that I can give you of modules. Um, we're gonna be doing some more impressive things uh, a little bit later. Uh, but this is kind of like the dream I had for modules, was that you could have this collection of modules that have really common functionality that everybody needs on their site. And you can just literally drop it in and be like, ah, cool, now I've got a contact form. I didn't have to spend any time writing stupid form tags and you know, setting it up to send an email. Like, we can all do that in five minutes, but why? Why would we if we don't have to? Um, so that's, like, that's the power, that's the beauty behind modules. If you get nothing out, else out of today's session, I want you to be excited about the idea of modules and not duplicating code. And um, want to uh, make use of the module system in your applications. That would be probably my biggest um, desire, is that you don't just throw all of your code into an application module. Please don't do that. That's not the purpose of the module system. So um, this is the contact form. This is the CAPTCHA. This is probably not the best CAPTCHA in the world. Type these letters backwards. I think we could probably break that in about five seconds. Um, so we're going to um, change the CAPTCHA without actually touching the module's code in any way, shape, or form. And then we're going to actually look at why we were able to do that. So to um, change the, somebody's doing something back there. Um, to change the CAPTCHA, we're going to look at the, uh, the configuration first. And when you install a third-party module, that's a good hint, is to always take a look at its configuration. And you can do that just by opening it up, by contact, opening up its config. And immediately something that you can uh, notice is that it's got a local config file. That should be named .dist. So somebody, if you want to uh, do your first pull request to an open source uh, project, that would be a really good one. Um, it should be named dot dist. And uh, that is immediately just a hint without even reading any documentation that you, that's probably a file that it's saying you should drop into your autoload directory. Um, and the other cool thing about those dist files is, is they're kind of self-documenting. So you can, we can just open it up and take a look at it and see like, okay, what are the things we can do with the configuration for this module? And we can immediately say, see, oh, okay, there's a fly contact key and under that, look at that, CAPTCHA we can probably tweak the CAPTCHA a bit. Um, it also has a key for the message, so you can kind of customize the, the actual email address and, and everything that, uh, and message that comes through. Uh, and then we have the mail uh, transport. So we're gonna have to actually play with a couple of these to make this um, functional if we wanna actually submit it. But first we're gonna do the CAPTCHA. So I'm gonna copy that um, 
config file into my autoload directory. Config autoload. All right. So now underneath uh, skeleton, and I'll make this a little bit bigger. Skeleton config autoload, we've got module.flycontact.local. All right, and um, if we were to try to load it now, we'd get an exception because it's trying to use reCAPTCHA, and there's two problems that we have with using reCAPTCHA at this point. The first problem is that we don't actually have an API key and everything for reCAPTCHA to work. The second problem is that all of the, almost all of the code in Zen Framework, uh, in Zen Framework that interacts with third-party services was split out into separate repositories. So the reCAPTCHA code that actually works with their API um, is part of Zen Framework, but it's a separate, um, it's a separate repository, and you have to pull that in. Is it that bad, man? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, um, so those are the two problems. We can't actually use reCAPTCHA. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, instead of have reCAPTCHA as the class, I'm going to set it to figlet, F-I-G-L-E-T. And you don't actually need any options. You can leave them there. They won't hurt, but I'm going to comment them out so that we can see what's being used. Figlet is also not a secure CAPTCHA. These are CAPTCHAs really that were included for your use in development and stuff. So you can have a CAPTCHA there and see that it would exist. But this would be a great example of where you would have something overridden in local, uh, a local config file in production. So your config file in production, that local, you maybe, maybe just have like contact form CAPTCHA.local.php, whatever. Um, it would define this CAPTCHA class and your actual private and public keys for recapture. So with that set, if we refresh, we should get something that looks like this. Nice ASCII art CAPTCHA. Again, not much more secure, but uh, at least more annoying for the programmer that's trying to crack it, right? Um, so that's it. We just, we just tweaked that config file. That's cool, but the only reason that worked, right, is because Matthew thought of this, right? And he put it in the config file and actually wrote the code to toggle that. Um, yeah. Go back to the config file. And scroll up so you can see it just returned. It's just returning the uh, array there. <coughs> this whole config file is in the fly contact um, modules config directory. You can just copy it straight from there, and then I just changed the class to figlet. Uh, into the autoload, yep. So. Um, again, it's, it's because Matthew thought of this. He said, okay, well, they probably are going to want to tweak the CAPTCHA. And that's good. As a module author, you should be thinking that way and, and constructing your modules that way. Um, but the cool thing about Zen Framework 2 is if you just follow a couple simple patterns with dependency injection and using the service manager, then it really doesn't matter whether or not the module author enabled you to do that because you can actually override the services that that module provides and force it to use your own implementation. So you've got flexibility either way. It's just kind of like whether you get to do it a clean way that was obviously intentionally supported by the author or whether you're going to have to work around their stuff a little bit um, to get it to work. So the next thing I'm going to do once I'm confident everybody's done typing is show you how he got it to use this. Question? Yes. Oh, OK. I'm sorry. Um, OK. So. Let me give you a little background on dependency injection. So dependency injection is a pattern. It's, it's a concept. Um, in Zen Framework, we have two components. We have Zen Service Manager and Zen DI. I said don't use the Zen DI component. Dependency injection as a pattern is a very, very good thing, and you should always use it. Um, yeah. Yeah, don't go to Zen DI. Um, yep, just just avoid it completely. There's no good reason at this point to use it anymore. 
Um, and that's probably a candidate to be removed for Zen Framework 3, um, just to further discourage people from using it. All right, so let's take a look at how Matthew actually made this work. If you want to get into the code of a module, and this is going to be something that's going to happen really common, especially if you're using third-party modules, um, or you've got other developers who are working on a module that's separate from what you're working on. Um, that's quite interesting. Um, you're going to want to kind of start going through the code of a module. And the cool thing is with ZF2 modules is they're really easy to like just introspect and see what's going on and how they work. And that is because the way that Zen Framework 2 learns everything about a module is by asking it. So you can kind of do exactly what Zen Framework 2 does and follow everything that's in the module really, really easily. And the single entry point, which I, you're going to hear me say probably one or two more times to a module, is the module.php class. So like we have the application module here, right? Zen Framework 2 does not know about this config directory or this language directory or this source directory or this view directory. Only thing Zen Framework 2 knows about is module.php. And it loads that, and it uses that class to ask it everything else. Um, so you can always go into module.php and just start inspecting a module and see what, what it provides. So this is the application module. This is actually not the one we want to look at. Um, we want to look at fly contact. So I'm going to look at his module.php file. All right. Um, we're going to talk about git auto loader config later. Um, but the only other method you can see here that he's got is git config. Right? And he includes uh, the module.config.php. This method, the only thing it needs to do, the git config method, is return an array. So how you do that is entirely up to you. He could have just typed the whole array right here in this method if you wanted to. This is just an organizational thing, a kind of best practice that's suggested um, as far as having a separate file for it. So we can, we can follow it, right? We say, OK, the git config method is grabbing config module.config.php. And we can start to see what he's got going on here. Um, he's got a top level key of fly contact. So he actually has some defaults set here. Um, you see the same keys and the same values that we saw in that local config file. So if you delete the local config file, it's going to fall back to these. This is always loaded. The local config file is just overriding um, some of these things. So um, if we keep scrolling down, though, there's some more stuff, more top level keys. The top level keys are the ones you want to look for. If, if there's a top level key in some modules config like this, that's fly contact, that is important, but it is not used by the framework, right? It's not, um, not really consumed directly. That's consumed by the module itself. Um, these other ones, though, if you see like controllers, router, um, service manager, view manager, all those, those are things that are consumed by the frame framework and understood by the framework. Um, so what we've got here, and the, the interesting one, is we want to look at the services. And we're, because we're particularly interested in the form, right? And the captcha and how it got to uh, be. So we can see here under the service manager key, we've got some factories. And I'm going to talk about what factories are and how they work. Um, but we've got one for the CAPTCHA and one for the form itself. And um, you can just follow this. Uh, I know it wraps, so it's kind of annoying. But we've got fly contact CAPTCHA. And you can follow the class name, fly contact service, contact CAPTCHA factory. We got rid of the prefixes and underscores in Zen Framework 1, so you don't have long class names. But look what we got in return, long class names. All right. So. We're going to open up that factory. This is that class name that it referenced. So this is not the CAPTCHA. The factory is just a class that can create the CAPTCHA. It has the, the code and the logic to actually create and instantiate it. So if we open it up here, you can see um, it's got the create service method. We're going to talk about how that works a little bit later. Um, but the create service method gets an instance of the service manager as a parameter to it. Um, and the first thing that it's doing is pulling out a service called config. So config equals services get config. And that config that it's going to return is the merged config from everything, that whole big array. So it's grabbing the config. It's making sure that it's an instance of uh, traversable. In fact, um, the framework does all this. Uh, he could just get rid of these three lines. I wrote the code. I know for a fact that the, those three lines are not necessary. Um, so that is just. 
That's everything. This module has access to all the configurations. Yes. So every module has access to everything from every other module, always. There's only one exception, which is an init method, which I'll talk about later. But um, for 99.9% .9 of cases, all your modules can access all the classes, all the config, everything from all the other modules. They're always available. Um, the concept of a module actually is, um, it's almost a lie. Like, modules don't really exist, which is a really weird thing when I'm sitting here telling you about modules. We're doing a modules workshop, shop, right? Um, but modules don't exist to the framework. Um, modules are really uh, a namespace, just a PHP top-level namespace. And um, so really, all you're doing is telling the framework, like, you can find controllers here, 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 and here. But it doesn't know that here, 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 and here are four different modules. It doesn't know that a directory is necessarily a module. It doesn't really know anything about that. So um, like a common question we get is like, well, how do I detect which module I'm in? I want to like switch the layout when I'm in a particular module or something. Well, kind of tough luck, because there's no such thing as a module. But you can't say, like, which module am I in? What you can ask is, what's the top level namespace of the controller that's being executed right now? They'll probably give you the module name that you're looking for. But the, that concept of a module that you're looking for, that concept just really doesn't exist. The framework doesn't know anything about that. Um, so that's like kind of a, a thing that you've got to wrap your mind around when, when using the framework. I've got a, because that, that layout question was actually a really, really common thing. I wrote a blog post about it. And then halfway through my blog post, I realized I could actually make a module to make this way easier. Um, so you can install a module called EDP module layouts. And then in your config, you can just define an associative array of module name to layout template, module name layout template. And it works exactly how everybody wants it to work. But the module name is really just checking the top level namespace of the controller. It's not actually saying, like, is it in this module? Um, because that is not a valid question, really. Um, so here it's grabbing the config, and that is the whole config from all the modules, including merged with the local and global config files. All that's into one big blob. We've got that blob right there in dollar $config. Uh, mm -mm. Remember, that one's not merged. We actually have another service that you can pull out of the service manager called application config. And you can actually access that array if you need, need access to that for some reason. Um, but config is everything but the application. Um, then what we're doing is we're actually pulling out the specific key. So under fly contact captcha, we're getting that value. And the reason he doesn't need to do an is set check here is because in his config that he ships with his module, he's already got it set. So he knows for a fact that it'll always be set if this module is installed. Um, it'll just either be his default or one that has been overridden um, by the user. And in that point, he's just using the captcha factory, which is uh, shipped with the framework. And he just passes it the array and returns the uh, returns the instantiated CAPTCHA. So um, this is the code that Matthew wrote to allow us to change that um, CAPTCHA. We could actually bypass this completely if we wanted to. And I won't spend the time to do it, because we're already going to be crunched for time. Um, but I'll show you real quick what we could do. All right. So. This is the module.config.php from his module, right? There's a key called service manager, and a key called factories, and then a key called fly contact capture. And he has that pointed to a class that's his own factory class, right? So let's just say we wanted to construct our own capture class completely. Um, this is all just config, right? And what can we do with config? We can override config. So what would happen if we, in our application, um, went into like our config autoload and maybe made like a um, captcha.global.php. And then we did something like this. We put the same service manager key, same factories key. That is really distracting. Um, and then we put, uh, what was it, fly contact captcha. I'm going to get that wrong. Um, kind of. I'll explain the difference uh, between those two in a second. Let me just 
copy paste so I don't screw that up. Okay, so um, here's what we could do. And I've got it actually set to the same value as his, so this doesn't actually change anything. Um, but if we created our own factory uh, that constructed our own um, CAPTCHA, we could change that value there. It would actually use our factory instead. The difference between what we did earlier when we overrode in the his local config file and what we're doing here is that in, in order for that local config file override to have worked, it required him to have the forethought. He had to, when he was writing his module, he had to do this. He had to say, OK, they probably want to change it, so I'm going to grab out of the config this array of CAPTCHA options, and I'm going to construct the CAPTCHA that way. So this gives them the flexibility to change it. If he had not done this, let's say that this code just said, like, CAPTCHA equals new uh, figlet, you know, Zen CAPTCHA figlet, or whatever, and it just returned that. How are we, get, we can't override his config, because there's no like, config key that has the cap class of the CAPTCHA. But what we could do is we could override this factory completely. So it never runs his factory, it runs our factory instead. <coughs> so there's multiple ways that you can get in and intercept a module without, we don't have to touch the module's code. We can leave his code in place. Um, we don't have to break it and like, you know, let's say he updates something later. Um, if you've gone in and tweaked it, you're going to screw yourself if you're sitting there editing vendor modules. So um, we can uh, do it in multiple ways. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, the difference? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it, this can be taken to another level, which is uh, we may have been really unlucky, and he may not even have done this. Um, that's when you just like email the guy and say, <laughs> hey, like, you're not doing it right. Um, in all reality, or just do a pull request and say, hey, this would be, it'd be much nicer if you, you split this out into a separate service, because people like me might you know, want to do it. They should be receptive to that. Um, but even if they didn't, like, let's say he just had a fly contact form, and he had the factory for that. And in that, he constructed his form, and he had another line of code that just said CAPTCHA equals new figlet CAPTCHA, whatever. Uh, and then he just said, you know, add input CAPTCHA, all of that, all in that fly contact form. Uh, you could still override that factory if you wanted to. You would just be, at that point, replacing more code than necessary. Do you have a question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a great question that doesn't have a good answer. Um, I mean, really, there's, there's not too much I can tell you. The, the, when you are sitting there writing config, um, I don't know of any IDE that's going to really give you a lot of help in these, these arrays. Um, what you can do is, like, when you're um, defining a factory, like, Defer as much stuff to PHP code as you can. So this is a great example where he's he's um, created these factories, but the factories themselves are PHP code. This is going to have completion, obviously, right? Um, so some of it's deferred, but obviously that can only be taken so far. Like you look at. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, there's there's that problem with. Um, yeah, so what are you saying is like you don't know if you pull service manager get fly contact capture, you don't actually know what the result of that's going to be because it could be what his factory returns or you could have overridden it and returned something else. Um, unfortunately, we're using PHP. <laughs> For better or worse, it's loose type. That's just the, huh? Yeah, I mean, you can, you can always just var dump, see what's going on. Um, I use Vim, so I, like, I am not used to code completion, so I don't miss it, um, for better or worse. I don't work for Zen. I, yeah, we have, Matthew doesn't use Zen Studio either. Uh, <laughs> OK, I don't know about that one. Um, yeah, I, I do contract training for Zen, but that's, really as far as my affiliation with them goes. I don't try to sell their stuff necessarily. Um, I, for my team personally, I tell everybody to use what they are most efficient in and what doesn't get in their way. And um, we've got some people using them, some people using PHP Storm. 
We've got one crazy ass developer that uses Gedit, which is like the Linux equivalent of Notepad, but not quite that bad. It at least has syntax highlighting and stuff, but it's pretty bad. Um, but he's he's quick in it. I can watch him code, and he has no problem. He's not getting inhibited by his editor. So whatever, you know. Yeah. Yeah, code completion is nice. Yeah. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. Um, unfortunately, just the, the config in ZF2 just lacks that. There's really no good solution. We'd have to do some crazy static analysis or something to figure out what's going on. Um, yeah, especially for like route config and stuff. Route config's the worst. So like here's like just for slash contact. Like we literally just have a slash contact here. And that is from here all the way down to here uh, is just for slash contact. Um, to have a slash process after that, we have to add all this. So like it's very, very verbose. Um, yeah, so YAML makes large, complex, uh, nested key value things much easier to read. Um, the other thing is, like, you can't memorize it. No, no, like, human memorizes this. So um, I always tell people, like, don't even stress yourself trying to, like, type out route configs. Just go find one <laughs> and copy and paste it and change it. Because um, I can never remember that route is underneath options, but type is not underneath options, and just st stuff like that. But I, I've been using Zen Framework for a long time, and I can't. I can't do that. Some people can, more power to them, but um, that's, that's my solution to not having the code completion is just I copy and paste from places where I've gotten it working in the past um, in a lot of places. So. Uh, yeah, so for route config specifically, yeah, there is there's a bunch of documentation in the ZF2 docs. Um, I can tell you right now, may terminate means that uh, you can go to slash contact without going to slash process. Um, if you don't have may terminate, it's going. You have a slash contact route, but it's saying that's a route you can't actually go to. You can only go to slash contact slash something else, um, one of the child routes. But as far as the documentation, yeah, you have to go to the ZF2 docs um, and and really just just read them. Uh, the route config is is kind of rough. So I don't have like a lot of easy tips, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, a much better example, actually, we're going to do, uh, I think we do ZFC user, but no, we don't do ZFC user. So let me show you ZFC users. Yeah, so you should have the um, developer toolbar and slash contact. Uh, loading a form and the ASCII art captcha figlet. Um, that's all we've done so far. So um, one thing I want to show you though is like you can be as helpful or not helpful to your users um, of your modules as you want as far as the config goes. So um, Matthews is, was not bad if we were looking at that dist file. He's got you know some documentation about what it is and. Um, shows you the different options that you have and so on. Uh, ZFC user, I took it to even another step. And if you go to the dist file for ZFC user, um, we've basically broken it down to each config value you could possibly set and got it nice and clean. So like you can set the um, ZenDB adapter that you're using and the alias name for it. And it has documentation on that. And like each key, you've got a key and a value, a key and a value. Um, is documented really well, and it just kind of constructs this big array. And so you can install ZFC user and just start scrolling through this conf config class or uh, config file, and say like, oh, okay, I want the um, captcha to be a figlet and the word length and whatever. You know, I want to not use usernames and only use email addresses or whatever. You can see every option that ZFC user has. Um, yeah, this is ZFC user under ZFC base. It's not in the, the USB stick. This is just kind of an external example I wanted to show you real quick of um, how you can be a little bit more verbose in your config uh, as far as like those disk configs. 
go. So, all right. Um, so we installed Fly Contact and we customized the CAPTCHA. That's pretty much it. If you try to submit the form, it's not going to work because it's. Uh, let's see here. It's going to try to connect to like Gmail, I think. X E B O. Uh, oh, that's an email address. Oh, and if you see this, that's an F. Somebody tried to get really creative and yeah, make it like the Zen Framework F. Yeah. I remember the first time I saw that, I was like, what the hell? Oh. <laughs> All right, so yeah, you can see it's just spinning right now. It's going to time out. Um, what I do is in development and also in um, my CI environment, my testing environment, uh, anything that uses mail, I set to the file adapter for email, which will just write the file, like the whole MIME thing, out to a file. Um, that's really handy because you don't have to like go back to your inbox or refresh. It's just a directory, and you can just see the emails right there, open them up in the text editor. So it's, yeah, debugging email is, is a total pain. And if you can just dump those emails to text files, like that helps simplify. Oh, that's nice. Uh, bingo. Yeah, so what we can do here is if you open up the local config file, uh, make sure that I open up the right one. You can see he's got mail transport. And so I'm just going to change it from transport SMTP to transport, I think it's file. Um, and then there's options. Underneath options, I think there's only like one that you need to specify, which is like path. I'm guessing at this point. I'm sorry. Um, and remember, it's a relative path. Uh, to your project's root, right? So where we want to stick it is probably like the data directory. We have a cache directory. I'm going to create like a mail directory underneath there. And um, so we can just do like slash data slash mail. Like that. There may be, uh, I'm either wrong on this path key or there may be another option I need to also set. But let's see. Sometimes I get lucky and I actually do things right on the first try. Not very often, though. <laughs> All right, so I do evan.rove.com, <coughs> subject, message, and myui. She just turned captures off in development. This is terrible. All right, send. Thank you, message has been sent. If, uh, yeah. <coughs> There you go. You can see it created like a dot temp file here. And that's exactly what it would be passing to the SMTP server. So, uh, that's, yeah, that's really, really handy uh, for debugging emails. If you've got like a template that's not injecting the right stuff into that email, you can just, it's like var dump for emails. Hmm? The config. So um, this is specifically like this mail transport key is something that, um, Matthew's module is consuming. But what he's doing is there's a, um, a factory that consumes this array, this exact array that ships with Zen Framework 2. Uh, and if you, I'll switch back to this in a second, but I just want to show you. Fly contact, service, and it's the mail transport factory right here. Um, and you can see what it's actually doing. So it grabs the config, which is that whole array. Um, under mail transport key, it gets the class and the options. And um, actually, it looks like there's not a good factory, so he had to kind of write one here. Um, so he, uh, yeah, they're kind of inconsistent. Uh, so he wrote his own factory where if the class name is, you know, you have a full class name where he actually supports the short ones. Um, then he constructs the class and he passes it the options um, and, and so on. This is, I, I'll point it out since it's already on the screen, this is something you'll see a lot in Zen Framework 2, is these options classes for things. And we actually did that to make people's lives easier who do depend on code completion. Um, because you have this options class, and that will fully have code complete. And you can see all the options that you can set right there. 
Um, so that kind of halfway answers your question or, or addresses your, your concern. Um, Yeah, you do like a var, at var um, to specify that that's what it is. Um, exactly. So you can, you can kind of work around it in cases, but no matter what you do, if you, in your config array files, you're just you're not going to get any code completion out of them. Um, but Yeah, Zen form is it can be rough. Um, that depends on how you define your forms, though, because you can define forms as big arrays, or you can actually just build them up as objects called in the add method and stuff. Yeah, then you you lose your your completion at that point. So, um, but you could you could do like new element text area, and then you could you have full completion on that, and you could call set whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. That's, that's a fairly common approach. We kind of do that with ZFC user. We actually trigger an event in ZFC user when the form initializes itself. It says, "Hey, everyone, I exist now. I'm a form. Look at me." And the listeners actually get a reference to that form, so they can call add on it. They can remove elements or whatever. So you can, through a listener, completely customize the ZFC user form without even touching ZFC user's code at all. Which is really cool. So you can add like extra fields to the sign up form, stuff like that. Yeah, just always go to module.php and you can just start grepping through um, everything that the module provides. Um, but these option classes, sorry, I got sidetracked. The options classes are a common thing in Zen Framework 2. It was a decision we made as a group to um, do this instead of just having a config arrays and constructors everywhere um, to start making concrete options classes. We didn't really finish doing this everywhere. So you'll see it sometimes, and then other times you won't see it. And I can't do anything other than say I'm sorry. Um, it's just like we, we had to release in Framework 2. Everybody's waiting on it, and we just weren't done. Um, so sometimes you see this, this options thing. Uh, and that's what he's using. He's just passing that array to it, and it consumes it. And then the constructor for the SMTP takes that, that options object. I believe in most cases where you have this, um, this can consume the array um, directly. And it'll say, if is array, it's going to just do this. It's going to just create it. So that's how it's, the decision was that that's how all the constructors were supposed to be. We just, that might be another thing that Zen Framework 3 improves is going through and kind of finishing a lot of that. So, um, but this is why uh, we can tweak that. That mail transport there in the config. So. Um, yeah. Uh, in this case, there should be a mail transport factory. I don't know why there's not. This, like this code right here that we're seeing, I would argue should be in the framework. I don't see any reason that this should not be in the framework itself. Um, we have it in most other places. Like you saw the CAPTCHA factory. It just took that whole array, including the class name, and was able to create it. So like we have things like, um, here you go, ZF2 library CAPTCHA factory. And this is really just like a static method factory. And it go, goes through and you know gets the class name and the config, calls new class, passes the options. That's in the framework so that you don't have to write that code. The fact that Matthew had to write that code for the SMTP transport, in my opinion, is just something missing from the framework. Um, so no, not necessarily moving away from factories. What we moved away from in Zen Framework 2 from Zen Framework 1 is magic. Um, in Zen Framework 1, there was a lot of stuff that just worked. Like you just created these directories, and it knew that you had a directory called controllers, and you created a directory called views, and it knew about that. Yes, yeah. So in Zen Framework 2, you can't just create that controllers directory. You have to create the controllers directory and tell it uh, that that controllers directory exists and how to load your code out of there. You have to actually inform the framework of everything you're doing. And that's intentional. So it's, it's extra work for you, the developer. But we did that um, 
to make it so that you have to learn how and why it works so that there's no question, there's no ambiguities as to how, how did this controller get loaded? How did it know that the controller actually existed? Um, you know the answer to that question because you're the one who had to tell the framework. Um, yes. Right. Yep. Yeah, that was that was a huge pain point in Zen Framework One was educating people on all the magic. We we constantly get questions as to you know why isn't my view script working? Why isn't this working? And it'd be because they didn't pluralize this folder name, and the framework was expecting the folder name to be plural or something like that. Um, and that's just that's not helpful to anybody to have those problems and to be running into that kind of stuff. So. Um, so it's kind of it's a it's a catch twenty two because we wanted to decrease the learning curve for Zen Framework 2 compared to what it was for Zen Framework 1. But in trying to do that, we realized that the real problem wasn't necessarily the learning curve as much as people not understanding what they're using. And so we, I, you can almost say we went the other way. Like it's actually a little bit steeper of a learning curve. But when you get through that, you have a much more intimate understanding of what you're doing, um, which allows you to be more efficient. Yep. OK, we got Wi-Fi in here now? Embassy 1? Embassy 1. And the SSID is links as something. Links as something. OK. Yes. Uh, that was 10,044. Cool. Yeah, so get connected to that Wi Fi. Embassy one. Yeah, so hop on the Wi Fi. That's very helpful. that'll be reliable for us. Um, for no, but I have something else that can help you. Is Here you go. This should charge you up. Mm -hmm. Funny, I got that for speaking at ZenCon, and then today they just gave me another battery pack. I'm not going to have problems with power. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know about that. That one's got a solar panel, which is <laughs> pretty cool. Um, all right, cool. So is everybody um, kind of good on, on this so far, what we've done, changing the mail transport? Uh, we also just learned that we could just make this the word file, and it would still work uh, by looking at his factory. And for as how I knew that it was a key called path under options, I literally guessed. I had no idea. So I just I got lucky that that worked. Normally, you'd have to check the docs. Um, something about ZF2 docs is they're not bad. I can't say that, right? But um, I usually tell people when they're learning the framework to not rely on the docs. Don't you even avoid the docs. And check the code first. So if like, you're curious what keys you have, um, instead of trying to go find the right page in the documentation for the mail transport stuff, just open up like Zen mail transport file and look at it and, and see what um, it actually takes. In this case, you actually have a file options class, which is going to be really clear. Because that's just going to be a class that has a bunch of properties that are the name of the keys. Um, but go ahead and look at the, the code first. <laughs> and um, additionally, uh, even better place to look, especially if you want examples, is the unit tests. Because everybody that commits code to Zen Framework 2 also commits unit tests. And those unit tests are um, 
basically every scenario that the author who wrote the code expects to work. So you're going to get like the examples of the intended use case of whatever you're you're trying to use if you go and look at the unit test. So a lot of people just ignore that test directory like it's it's not even there when they're building their applications. Use it. That's actually a really good resource. I mean it's it's unit tests for making sure we didn't break anything, but it's also a ton, a ton of really good examples for every component. Yeah, yeah. If you want to write your own unit tests, you can see how um, they're structured. We got Wi-Fi, so sweet. <laughs> nice. All right. So um, cool. Yeah. Check the code. Check the unit tests um, be, uh, before the documentation, even. So, all right, I think we're good to move on past our first exercise here. So any, any further questions about any of the stuff that we just did on the first exercise? We're all good? Cool. All right. So we get to talk about modules. This is why I told you don't go to my talk on tomorrow morning, because this is going to overlap a lot of it. Uh, find a more interesting one uh, to go to. Oh, did you do <laughs> No? Do you guys want a break? We can do a break. It'll be OK. Um, yeah. Let's take a few minute break. There's coffee and stuff, yeah. Sorry, I'm really bad at remembering breaks.
Yeah. There are definitely some things in ZFCUs that, that can be um, improved and cleaned up. It started as a proof of concept for the module system, just to show like what a module could be. It was actually called EDP user for Evan.pro. Um, so then I just kind of refactored it, started cleaning it up a bit, and uh, making it a generic use case module. Uh, but it's 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 solid. It's used by everybody pretty much, and um, we've yeah. Exactly. It's, it's meant to just solve that problem so that you never have to worry about user authentication and registration on your site. I've just spoiled like the next four slides, so sorry. <laughs> All right. So um, I think everybody is one more person. No? Yeah. Everybody's good. OK. So what is a module? Um, when creating the module manager, I was kind of uh, trying to come up with like this definition for like what's a module. And it's really hard to define, especially in Zen Framework 2. Um, I went around, I looked at all of the different implementations of quote modules, uh, Django, Ruby on Rails, um, Symfony with their bundles. I looked at all of them and um, what they did, what I liked, what I didn't like. Um, yeah, I looked at Magento plugins and um, their system is very interesting. Uh, they go very heavily against um, everything that I specifically built the ZF2 module system to to be, which is uh, no assumptions, which I'm going to talk about. But this is the best definition I was able to come up with, is that a module, it's a reusable piece of functionality that could be anything. Um, that can be used to construct a more complex application. So it's, it's part of your application, not the whole application. And the whole idea, the whole purpose, the reason I created the module system was so that you could write your code once, a once that code, uh, that piece of functionality is written, you don't have to write it again. Um, I always found myself, every time I started a new project, just doing like the same basic things over and over and over again. And that was just bothering the crap out of me. Every time I started a new project, oh, okay, we need a login form, okay, we need a you know, password field, and we need a salt and hash and just all that crap. It's like, why am I writing this code for the 17th time? This is stupid. So that was the, the motivation behind the module system. Yeah, it, it gets tired. And it, same thing. And you're writing code at that point that's not solving the problem of your application. You're not actually like solving the new problem. And that's what that's what we get excited about as developers, right? Is like we get a new project, we're like, sweet, we can solve this problem. You don't want to spend the first two weeks solving every problem but the problem that you're trying to solve. And that's what always ends up happening. So the module system is really just supposed to help ease that and um, really improve that. For developers. And um, better than writing code once is writing code zero times. So you can use modules that are already written. Um, that's another important thing that I tried to emphasize when I created this is creating an ecosystem that completely did not exist in Zen Framework 1. Um, we now have that. We have an ecosystem around modules. So speaking of Zen Framework 1, um, the quote modules in Zen Framework 1 really sucked, right? A, weren't really modules. They were just directories that held controllers. Um, you couldn't create like a reusable module. You, you, did you, have you ever gone to a website that says like download my Zen Framework 1 module and use it in your project? No. There's nothing like that out there. There's actually one called ZF Debug or something. It's, it's kind of like the debug toolbar. Um, but the installation process, you have to like paste in a front controller thing. Like it's, it's really obnoxious. Um, and that's the only guy on the whole internet I've ever found that figured out how to kind of distribute a module for Zen Framework 1. Yeah, there, there's a couple that like, yeah, there were a couple things for like bits and pieces of Zen Framework 1 things that you could paste in and, and stuff, but um, nothing like what we have with ZF2. So you couldn't create like a reusable module. You couldn't package it up and distribute it out to somebody. Um, the worst part, though, was how tightly coupled the module system in Zen Framework 1 was with the MVC layer. So there was a bunch of assumptions by the framework of what a module is. So the, every possible thing that a module in Zen Framework 1 could do has been defined in code in the framework. So a module can provide a bootstrap resource. It can provide a front controller plugin. It can provide a controller and a view and a few other things. 
that's it. That's all that the module could do because it had been pre destined to only be able to do those things because the framework had that code written in it. Um, not to mention the bootstrapping process for Zen Framework 1 modules is a joke. Um, everything had a bootstrap class, and you just had init, blah, 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 init, blah, 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 init, blah, blah, blah. And it called all those methods every single time. It didn't care whether or not you needed that logger or that database connection. It was going to create it. Who cares? What? Yeah, so you could, you could set them up as resources. Um, it, there were, were ways to work around it, but that's the thing is everybody had to work around it. And everybody ended up doing that. I think almost every ZF1 project I've come in and, and helped out with, they've had some layer on top of the bootstrapping layer um, of their own to, to help with that. So we wanted to solve a lot of these problems. So in Zen Framework 2, um, modules can be completely self-contained. They're portable. Um, and they can be reusable, which is the beautiful thing. We support FAR packaging. That was a much cooler bullet point before Composer um, took us by storm. But FAR packaging is like the jar or the, well, this is, a, I hate this, but the, like the EXE of the PHP world. Um, it lets you kind of bundle up a, a whole directory of code and everything and, and have one single executable that can be ran either command line or loaded by a web server or whatever. Um, your ZF2 modules can actually be FAR files as well. And that ask actually means that they could be zip files or tar files or tar gz files or anything that far, the far extension in PHP supports. Um, so like if you in your skeleton application right now that you've all got were to right click and send to zip the application module um, and then just delete the directory so you only have application.zip there, refresh the page, it's going to still load just like you did nothing. Um, it's pretty cool. Not many people know that it can do that. Um, don't do that. <laughs> um, and the reason I say that actually is because I said zip. Don't use any, if you, if you do use the FAR um, packaging, which is really cool. I, I actually added the FAR packaging support to Zen Framework 2. Um, it's a neat thing. And you can use FAR packaging. But don't use zip. Don't use tar gz. Don't use a compressed file format. Because you're going to be wasting CPU cycles decompressing that file every single request, which is just a waste. Um, so if you use like tar or far itself, the, the dot far file extension, which is something PHP can do, um, there's no overhead. There's no compression or decompression. In fact, I've had somebody who knows more about PHP internals uh, hint to the fact that there might be a tiny, tiny performance increase um, because you load one file um, into RAM and there's no more file system seeks. They just are seeking in RAM to um, each individual file. I don't know whether there's any merit to that. And with an opcode cache, it's probably completely negligible anyway. So don't obsess over those things. Um, but we have far packaging. We also have distribution now. Oh. Yeah, like my module dot far. Send it to your friend with email, and they can just drop it in their vendor directory and use it. They never touch it. That's another thing. That, that's kind of where my don't write into your modules directory um, tip comes from. Because if you write within a FAR file, you're going to have a bad day. It's not going to let you do that. Um, that's like the one catch if you want your module to be FAR compatible is like don't try to write in it. It's a read-only thing. Uh, there's an INI setting to enable you to write within modules, but that or within FAR files, but that's actually for creating FAR files, um, not for runtime. You're not supposed to actually have that turned on. Uh, package a new file. Yeah, I mean, well, there's kind of workarounds with that. I mean, if you look at, you'd have to like engineer a system, but like Linux package managers distribute their packages as like tarred up files, right? And with RPM and Deb, they all have things um, where you can get like a, a delta of, of those files. So if it's not compressed, you can actually create deltas and distribute deltas, but then you'd have to like create an ecosystem around that and maybe add support to that with Composer. I don't know. That would be more work than it would be worth. But yeah. Um, so, but now, nowadays we do have Composer and packages, and that really solves a lot of like where I was going with FAR. Um, that wasn't a thing when I created this originally. 
So Composer and Packages like, really just solves these problems. You can just, in your Composer JSON file, say, I want this module, this module, this module, these versions. And it's going to not only install those modules, but if they depend on any other modules or libraries, it's going to go and get the dependencies, install all of them, and set up your auto-loading for all of them instantly and take care of it for you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, if you install the Doctrine, it's called Doctrine Module. Um, it's actually a, an official ZF2 module supported by the Doctrine team themselves. It was written by Marco Pavetta, which is that guy. He works on my team. Um, yeah, he wrote that module. Uh, that's Ben. He wrote the router. I wrote the module system. Uh, Rob wrote like the book on Zen Framework 1, basically, and did a lot of the QA and stuff. Um, Gary Hawken, Alexi, they're all people in the Zen Framework community. Like I said, I pretty much hired the community. Uh, <laughs> Oops. That's like my biggest gripe about Composer. I've got my workspace right now, I think is like 13 gigabytes. And 90% of that is like just duplicate clones of Zen Framework 2 and stuff all due to Composer. Um, so the solution to that is, I'm sorry to say, not to not use Composer. Um, there may be other ways you can kind of hack around it. Um, So you have like uh, and then all your projects refer to that autoload.php from that composer. Eh, that can actually work. Yeah. Yeah, I've, that's, I do that with every client. I usually come on the first thing I do if they don't have a Vagrant set up is I set them up a Vagrant. Now I'm kind of more of a Docker fan, but usually they've got like developers on Windows and stuff, so Vagrant is, is nice to, to have them set up. But that's actually an interesting approach, uh, having like a, just like a separate directory, separate like project that just holds like a composer.json with your dependencies and then referring to that. Um, Yeah, is Jordy, I don't think Jordy's here this year. He was here last year, Jordy, who wrote Composer. Um, th there's actually, a, you'll notice, uh, if you go through the skeleton application, there's a lot of hints in there that I don't like Composer. <laughs> um, I, I do like Composer now, actually. I've, I've kind of reversed my opinion. But that was one of the big things that bothered me, is that every project that you have, I have a lot of ZF2 <laughs> projects in my workspace, have to clone all their own dependencies. You can't just have like ZF2 sitting somewhere and tell Composer, like, hey, just use my ZF2 that I've got. Um, and so, like, okay, yeah, so there's a composer talk. Yeah, you can bring it up there. Yeah, so, like, the module path thing that I've got set up solves that, right? If you don't use composer, you just use ZF2's module loading, you can do that. You could just have, like, var share ZF2 modules or something, and that would just be where it grabs some modules from. But composer adds a lot of value with dependency management and stuff like that. Um, but you can see, like, in the skeleton application for Zen Framework 2 itself, for example, if you have an environment variable called ZF2 underscore path defined, it's going to use that to load ZF2 and ignore whatever. Um, and that's because I didn't want to install, like, 100 versions of ZF2 on my computer. So that's why the skeleton has that uh, built in. Hmm? Oh. I heard something. Okay. Going crazy. Um, so yeah, we've got Composer, Packagist. Um, we have a site now, modules.zenframework.com. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, bootstrapping is now actually really fast and very lightweight. So adding more modules isn't going to slow things down. Having more services set up isn't necessarily going to slow things down, because it's only loading the things it needs for a particular request. And that's actually by nature of the service manager that kind of um, 
accomplishes that for you. You get that for free if you break up your, your application into services. Uh, multiple module paths, like I said, you can do that with the ZF2 module autoloader um, by default, but Composer um, kind of has its own way of doing things. And this is the most important thing. This is like the big difference between Zen Framework 1 and Zen Framework 2. Um, also between other systems, like if you look at Magento's plugin system or WordPress's plugin system or um, Symphony bundles, anything. They all define what a module can be. They have like different things that it can specifically hook into and all that stuff. Zen Framework 2, like I said, doesn't know what a module is really. It knows that it can like load a module.php file and call a couple methods on it, but besides that, it doesn't have any knowledge of uh, that a module provides a controller or that a module provides a view script. It, it doesn't know that. That logic exists nowhere in the framework. And by having no assumptions, you have unlimited power. Your modules can do anything you want. So what can a module actually be? It can be literally anything. So I was talking a little bit about this over the break. You can have a module be a plugin for an existing application, right? So it might add a payment method to an e-commerce platform. So you might install the PayPal module or the authorized.net module or the Bitcoin module, whatever. And um, it just by dropping in that module, you've added an, a new payment method. Um, a module could be a theme. You don't have to build a theming engine in Zen Framework 2. If you want to have themes in Zen Framework 2, you just add a module, and that module is your theme. Because modules can provide view scripts, they can override other view scripts, you can actually provide static images, which we're going to talk about how that's possible. Um, so you can have just a module that is a, a, um, a theme. And to, to show. Yeah, I was going to show. <laughs> <laughs> a too small. Hold on. I'm going to spoil all the slides. Can't do that. Um, I'll show you. I, I, I have an answer for that. Uh, all right, let me get back to. Okay. So, themes, right? Um, Spec Commerce is an e commerce platform in Zen Framework 2. One of the next slides is going to explain more about it. But if you install Spec Commerce, it's really ugly. It's uh, just Twitter bootstrap, plain, white, gray, nothing pretty. Um, but if you go to my client's site, their staging site for Spec Commerce, this is just Spec Commerce installed with some data actually populated um, with one extra module that's not open source installed, which is the SWM theme module, Southwest Medical Theme. And that theme completely changes the whole look, the whole structure of the HTML, the everything. Uh, adds CSS, adds the buttons, everything. It's completely just provided by that module. So that module is the theme. Um, we have no theming engine specifically to allow all this, but um, it, it works fine. So that's yeah, to go to a completely plain Twitter bootstrap. Uh, You'd actually lose like the promotions and some other stuff that are specifically brought in um, by the SWM stuff, but um, which we have plans to like make generic modules for that that hasn't happened yet. But um, we're going to talk about that. That's that's the the next trick is that modules that provide static assets are outside of your document root, so that's kind of a problem. Um, there's a solution for it. So we're going to talk about that. All right. So it can be themes. Um, the other thing is you can have libraries. So there's two ways to go about this um, particular thing. The um, first is that a library can just be a ZF2 module. So you could write a generic PHP library that you have no intentions to specifically be used with Zen Framework 2, um, but just also throw a module.php into that. Why not? make it easy for ZF2 users to consume it, right? Um, so you can do that, and that would just define like auto-loading stuff or, or something like that. Um, but the more interesting thing that you can do is you can provide integration with existing libraries. Um, so like we have the Doctrine 2 module, which is, is what he was explaining. You install this Doctrine 2 module. It not only installs Doctrine 2, um, it also provides a bunch of integration. Like it provides Zen form, um, 
DB record exists and does not exist uh, validators. It provides uh, uh, a bunch of other things that, that integrate with the framework itself. So um, not only can you provide integrate or um, provide support for that library, but you can provide integration to the framework um, as well. Uh, Twig supports another example of that. So if you don't like PHTML files, you want to use Twig for your templates. Um, we have like a ZSD Twig module that you can install, and you can just start putting your view script dot Twig in your directory, and it'll just work. Uh, so that's another thing. And then finally, you can have full blown applications, right? Um, I do explicitly discourage you from building a full application inside of a single module. That's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking more about um, the meta concept of you have a blog or an e-commerce platform that is composed of 15 or 20 modules. It's those modules working together that actually creates that, that module or that uh, application. All right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can you can create, and that's the other thing is like different permutations of modules can be entirely different applications, just like different functionality mixed together. Um, so, one of the biggest questions I get, or one of the most common questions I get, specifically related to modules, is like, how do I actually split my application up? Like, when do I make a new module? So I'm going to try to answer that. There's no clear cut answer, so I'll just say that right now. So don't expect like a set of rules you can go down and, and decide. Um, but this is kind of an example of how we broke up spec commerce. Actually, spec commerce is like 40 or something modules now. It's, it's grown quite a bit, but this is uh, the basics. So we've got ZFC user, which provides user authentication registration, and ZFC base is a dependency of that. Um, and we've got ZFC admin. ZFC admin is actually a really basic module that just provides like a slash admin route and a layout, like a layout template, uh, and what else? There's like one other thing. It, it just provides like a couple things like that. It's really really basic. Uh, I think like an ACL check or something. Um, but it's up to all the other modules to like provide tabs and other stuff into it. It's just like kind of a shell for you to have an administration interface. Um, but the, the most interesting thing is, like, let's look at spec address, for example. The module spec address is uh, a module that I created to start solving the problem of we have customers, and customers need to have shipping addresses, and we want them to be able to manage their shipping addresses, right? So they log in, user's got an address book, they can add addresses, they can set their default shipping address, whatever. Um, so I started writing spec address. Spec address knows nothing about e-commerce. It knows nothing about users. It knows nothing about shipping or anything. Spec address is just addresses. It provides a database table that can hold an address that has an ID. It provides a form that allows you to set values. It provides uh, a service for creating, editing, deleting um, addresses. But it doesn't do anything more than that. It's just like the very basic CRUD um, for addresses. That's it. Nothing else. So any application that I ever build in the future that I need addresses in, I'm just going to install spec address. And I'm just going to add the address table from spec address, and I'm going to have addresses. I'm never going to have to create an address form again. I'm never going to have to create an address table with address line one, address line two, postal code, any of that. Um, that problem has been solved by spec address, right? Um, validation, et cetera. Um, but then what I did is we created a, another module called spec user address. It's cropped, obviously. Um, but we call this one spec user address. Spec user address knows about ZFC user, and it knows about spec address. It provides a linker table, user ID, address ID. And it also provides a tab underneath the user dashboard um, for managing addresses. And it basically decorates the service pr provided by spec address so that when you get like a um, call to get a list of addresses. It's going to do a join and say where user ID equals um, to only get their addresses. And when you go to update an address, it's going to make sure, OK, is this address that they're trying to update actually theirs? A um, couple other things like that. But um, it's spec user address that actually creates that business logic of we've got a customer. The customer has a list of addresses that they can manage. Spec address knows nothing about that. So that's one example of how you could maybe 
break out that functionality. Correct, yeah. Any of you can start using spec address. You've got users that can manage their own addresses. Yeah, so if you install, and there's, there may be a couple interdependencies that I'm missing, but a, a watered down version, if you were to install ZS user, ZFC base, spec address, spec user address, and spec user dashboard, you'd have a web application that where users could register, log in, and manage a list of addresses for themselves. Yes, these all depend on spec commerce is completely built on ZenDB currently. Yep. Yep. Spec address out of the box will just give you the ability to list addresses and update those addresses and add addresses, but there will be no ACL, there will be no anything. It's just literally addresses in a database table. Um, okay, so yeah, you could do it. Um, it would require more work, and since this is actually being funded by a client, um, they're not going to pay us to add doctrine support when they're not using doctrine. Um, so it would require a little bit of extra work. ZS user, for example, supports doctrine. Uh, that's the next slide. <laughs> but um, it supports doctrine and all that stuff, but that's because we split out the adapters and we created a separate doctrine adapter and stuff like that. Um, okay. So then we have, we have some other ones, like spec contact is interesting. Um, that is just basically a, a holder for contacts, and we have... Uh, in spec commerce, there's a few different uh, notions of contacts. Like we've got vendors and we've got manufacturers, and then you can have contacts at these different companies and stuff like that. Um, so spec contact is just like a generic way to like hold companies and people and phone numbers and all that metadata that goes along with running e-commerce stuff. Um, when like an order is placed, uh, we might because you don't want to necessarily just have a, in, in e-commerce, it's kind of a common thing when an order is placed, you don't necessarily just store like the user ID. Um, you actually like duplicate everything. You say, okay, I'm going to create a new row for their address and their name and their phone number and all that stuff that's bound to this order. So if they change stuff in their account, it's not screwing up the order, um, whatever. So we can like use spec contact for that. When they place an order, we can dump all their contact information out into a contact entity if we wanted to. Um, maybe not the best example, but um, that's just a very generic module that can be used in a million different use cases. Um, another good example that I don't have up here is I've created, um, I wanted to do like comments, right? I wanted to do like just enable people to leave comments on something. And then I got to thinking, well, that's discussion, right? That's just like an author and a message and then you have replies. And I was like, oh, okay, you do threaded replies so that message has like a parent message ID. And then I got to thinking, okay, that can be used for message boards, right? Like discussion forums and stuff. And so what I did is I created EDP Discuss, which is like spec address. It, all EDP Discuss knows about is conversations and threads. And you just have a, a conversation ID and it has message IDs. And message IDs can relate to other message IDs. But that's it. It's just completely generic. Um, it has those database tables and the services for inserting messages and, and stuff like that. Yeah, generally the module order doesn't matter, but I'm going to talk about some scenarios where it can matter. Um, specifically, config merging, which we talked about earlier, um, can get sensitive to it. And that all just kind of really depends. But in most cases, the module order doesn't matter. Um, so I created EDP Discuss. If you install EDP Discuss, it doesn't really do anything. But then I have like a EDP forum, and that gives you like a full-blown forum. Like a, you can create topics, you can create threads, and, and all that stuff. Um, and it just uses EDP Discuss, that underlying framework. Then you can have like a, a EDP comments, which I haven't built this module yet. But that would be like a module that would have a view helper for like comments on your blog and stuff like that. And those would also be stored by EDP Discuss. So just any time you have any concept of threaded discussions, product reviews, or whatever it might be that you're just kind of posting messages, EDP Discuss can be used as a, a solid foundation for that. So you don't have to recreate that functionality. Um, 
So ZFC user is a, another really good example of um, how to break off common functionality. You drop ZFC user in, you've got registration, authentication. Um, it's really simple and it's highly extensible. You can pretty much bend that thing to do anything you want without touching its code. Security is really hard to do uh, in general. And my rule of thumb is that I should know enough about security to know that I know nothing about security. Um, that's a good place to be in. Uh, if you think that you're good at security, that means you probably don't know enough about security. So, um, ZS user has been through the, the test of time. We've, we've had a lot of really, really smart people look at it, um, make sure that we're doing the right things and, and doing things correctly in it. We've got cross-site request, request forgery protection. Uh, we're using bcrypt to store passwords. When I first created ZS user, uh, I was using SHA-256 and a random salt for each user. And I thought, that's good, right? That's like best practice, kind of. That's not doing a single salt or not like not salting my passwords. It should be good. Now, apparently, you can like get some machines on Amazon and crack like any 15 character SHA-256 with any salt in the world in like 12 seconds or something. No, no, no. Like, Nope. So I'm not talking about. Mm -mm. I'm not talking about live attacks on your database. I'm talking about when you have an SQL injection, your whole database got leaked onto the internet, and there's a paste bin dump, and they've got all the time in the world to sit there offline and crack your passwords. Hmm. It, there's there's a ton of of tools for doing rainbow tables and all sorts of things. Um, and now that you've got these um, ASICs that are specifically, these chips that are specifically designed for running SHA-256 and um, certain types of, of computations that can run them incredibly fast. Most of those are being built for Bitcoin, but there's also a market for ASICs for cracking passwords. Um, that you can have like this $300 box that can run hash speeds that you would need millions of dollars worth of computers for because that processor is only meant to do that one thing. Um, in GPUs, you've got hundreds of cores, thousands of cores. Oh, man, you can crack passwords really fast. You can rent it for four cents an hour on Amazon. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's the problem, is it's really cheap to crack passwords nowadays. You can, you can rent, like, a $10,000 video card on Amazon for 14 cents. <laughs> so, like, it's a... So it's a serious problem, and I didn't know about this actually when I created it. It was EDP user at the time, back when I first created it, and that was one of the first feedback things that I got was like, dude, no, that's like, you can crack that real quick. Um, so we use bcrypt now. bcrypt is a intentionally computationally intense hashing algorithm. It's meant to be slow. Um, so ZFC user uses that, and, and it basically makes it today computationally impossible to, to crack these passwords. Um, and the cool thing is you can, over time, increase that difficulty. So as hardware evolves, you can just change the parameter and rehash the passwords without invalidating everybody, um, because the difficulty is part of the hash, built into the hash, which is really cool. So you can um, evolve the hashes as hardware evolves. So like we solved all those problems. That's another cool thing about modules, is um, a problem can be solved once, solved well, and done so that you don't have people reinventing things and um, you know, trying to come up with their own security. Um, ZFC user also, it works with ZenDB out of the box, but we have modules to make it work with Doctrine, um, MongoDB, and uh, there's, I think there's a couple others. But it, it pretty much will work with whatever you want it to work with. And this is my favorite part. This is like why I built modules. All right, so ZFC user is extended by a bunch of third-party modules. There are plugins for ZFC user. I didn't even create a plugin system for ZFC user. I didn't like say like, okay, here's the things you can plug into. Um, this is just things that people were able to do externally without touching ZFC user's code. Um, So 
Right. Yeah, so, yeah, there, um, and when I say extended, I don't literally mean they extended the class. Um, I'm just getting water, don't mind me. Um, but they're adding functionality externally. So um, you can see there those examples. I think they're just the names of the modules. So SCN Social Auth, that first one. You install SCN Social Auth. You add in the config file. It's just got a disk config file you can copy. You put your Facebook API key, your Twitter API key, your Google API key. And suddenly, all of your users can log in with any of those social services. That's it. You didn't have to do anything. It just works out of the box. And he was able to create that module without even changing anything in ZF's user. Um, because I, in ZF's user, define everything in services and factories, he could just override the adapter that he needed to override and swap it with his own. Um, you just got to be aware of it. Um, and that's just a discipline when you're doing open source software. Um, you've just got to really be aware of uh, what are the publicly accessible points of your module. And once you expose something publicly, then as long as you've got that 1.x version number, <laughs> then you're committing to your users that those public endpoints are going to be the same. Um, if you plan on changing one of those public endpoints, then you need to change your version number to dot something. That's, that's semantic versioning. That's why the, that policy exists. Um, Zen Framework follows that very, very strictly, the framework itself. Uh, Symphony, let's show you this real quick. I, I like showing this. So Symphony 2.0 to 2.1, OK? This is their guide on how to upgrade your Symphony 2.0 application to 2.1. Notice the scroll bar on the right. So as you can see, I'll speed up here. They don't follow that rule. And there were a lot of really, really, really pissed off people um, because of this. And um, this is what I'm talking about, why it's a discipline on the developers. So there's not really anything we can do as a framework to enforce modules to stay compatible or anything like that. It's just, um, it's just a best practice thing. When you, when you expose a service and you name it something and you publish it and tag that with a version number, whether or not that's the right name and you decide later, like, crap, that was a crappy name, well, you know, it's tough. You just release that version with it that way. Um, commit to your users and, and keep it uh, backwards compatible. If you want to change it, you can. Just change the version number up to 2.x and, you know, tell them, okay, we, we, that is telling them that we break breaking backwards compatibility. So. All right. Um, and there's other ones. BJY authorized ads like roles and access control it integrates with Zen permission ACL. Um, Two-stage sign-up, email validation, they click to activate their account, uh, add user profiles, you can auto-generate usernames for your users, all sorts of stuff. Yep. <laughs> um, if they object to it, I just simply show them what it would cost to have built it themselves. Um, if you go to like ZFC user on it, Ulu's, uh, if you're at Ulu, it's like a open source project tracking metric site. Uh, let's just, it's not perfect. Um, go low, go low maybe. Um, I think I've got ZF's user on here. So, let's see, do they still have their cost? Maybe they got rid of it. Darn. So they used to have this cost metric that showed basically, based on the average hourly rate of a, a developer and the average predictivity of lines of code per hour of a developer and stuff like that, and the commit history, um, what a particular project would have cost to build. And like something simple like ZFC user over time, because of how much maintenance and everything goes into it, and um, it gets just really expensive. So um, yes, I've had clients object. Um, 
but it's not, it usually doesn't last very long. You wouldn't even believe the reasons. None of them are logical. It's, it's just an emotional response that business people have to the idea of open source software in general. They don't understand that using Zen Framework is no different than using a module. They, they think, oh, well, that's functionality that I can click on. That's different somehow than the framework code that everything runs on. There's, there's no logic. Like, I can't actually justify what they said because it's wrong. Um. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, the, the arguments are all over the board, but they're all just completely flawed uh, fundamentally. So. All right, so we've got the module site. Um, this is something I emphasize, and I always point this out because of, of, there's usually a, a decent portion of people in the um, audience at any of these that do have uh, companies that are reluctant to use open source stuff. Um, so first of all, I want you to always think to go look for a module before you start creating one. Um, always, 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 just check. And not just modules at zenframework.com, you can also just search GitHub. Um, ZF2 module and some keywords or something usually will find them. Also, Packagist is another site you can search for them on. Not everybody publishes them here. Um, we probably just have failed a little bit marketing-wise about telling everybody about the site. Uh, but if you also create a module that's open source, you can publish it. You just click GitHub login right here at the top. It signs you in with your GitHub account. It's going to give you a list of your repositories. And actually, it's only going to list the ones that are ZF2 modules, which is pretty cool. Um, and you just turn them on. You just click on each one that you want it to display on the site, and your module will be on the site. Uh, there's no approval process. So far, it hasn't been spammed, so we haven't had to do that. Zen Developer Tools is. Um, we kind of put together ZF Commons, the ZFC modules, to be that. It's not actually Zen the company. Um, it's just us community team. Um, yeah, we follow the same rules that we follow internally on the framework um, as far as ZF Commons modules go. Um, you can read about it if you go to the, um, it's like zfcommons.github.com, I think. We just have a really basic site, but you can talk about uh, or read about like what we're kind of standing for in the different modules we have and stuff. Um, Um, yeah, they're, they're reviewed by people. The, the ZF Commons team uh, are mostly also contributors to the framework. So uh, maybe that just gives us uh, it's less true as time goes on and more people get really good at the framework. But at least in the beginning, when there was no establishment of best practices and stuff like that, we were really the only people that could say, like, OK, yeah, that's, that's a pretty decent way of doing that. Um, now that's, that's actually not really true at all. I've met people that are, know just a, as much about the module manager as I do, and I wrote the thing. So um, now that it's been a couple years, there's actually a lot of really smart people out there um, besides just us. But that was kind of our way of solving that problem initially was putting together ZF Commons and um, having a group of people review the code and, and manage the release of these modules that really know what's going on. Modules.zenframework.com, anybody can publish any module to the site. Um, we put the ZF Commons modules on here. They're also listed in here. But ZF Commons is a group. Um, if you go to like our GitHub repository or GitHub page, um, those modules are just um, reviewed by a specific group of people. And if you go to our wiki um, on there, you can read about like we have a process for um, voting on what can become a module, and we have some other stuff. So long story short, check before writing your own modules. Also, um, consider what pieces of your application are generic functionality. That's an important thing. Like, you, do, are you sitting there adding addresses to your application? Like, that's not really a proprietary, like, top secret piece of functionality. You could probably break that off. Um, and see if you can find modules that solve your problems. Um, if you do find yourself writing a module, and for some reason the one you found doesn't work, and you, you decide to write your own instead of working with that person, you should really work with the person and see if you can improve it. But um, if you do find yourself writing a new module, um, and you will, consider open sourcing it. Like, 
just think about like what am I writing? Is this something that is proprietary to this application, or is this something we can make generic and, and help other people solve this problem? Um, and try to do this. Not every company is going to be on board with this idea, but if you go home one day and then this module pops up that really excellent solves the problem that, that your company is having, and <laughs> under, some and under some anonymous name that has nothing, you know, whatever. Um, but seriously, think about it, because a, a very small percentage of any given application is actually the proprietary part. Even if, if uh, you know, companies think like to think that their software is, is highly proprietary and highly top secret. Um, I've worked on some really um, sensitive things as far as being proprietary, and even on on some of the worst projects. I say worst, I just mean like most sensitive. Um, it was still really small percentages of that project that were actually sensitive, um, that weren't just common functionality like logging users in and stuff like that. So really consider open sourcing when you can. So I'm going to walk you through kind of the steps that you should go through in your head uh, when you create a module. So step one, right? Think of a name. No. Nope. What I just tell you is the first step you should do before you write a module. Okay. Check it. Check if it's already out there. Step zero. We're programmers. We count from zero. So, um, so step zero is to check for existing modules. Step one, if you don't find an existing module, think of a name. Because you need a name. You can't actually start writing your first line of module code until you have a name. And that's because of the name, the namespace for your module class. So when you name your PHP, or name your module, it's a PHP namespace. So the same rules apply. Ubar, that's a valid name. Uh, can't start with a number, can't have a dash, can't have a period. Um, the same names as PHP namespaces. Also, if you're open sourcing it, which you should be, uh, come up with a little prefix like this. There's no like central authority for these, but the idea is that it does the community no good to have 100 user modules called user module, or 100 markdown modules called markdown module. Um, so if you create a little prefix like that, it just helps differentiate and identify um, the modules a bit more. So. Uh, technically, namespaces can have an underscore. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, like, can it be prefixed with an underscore? Oh, like, can it be EDP underscore markdown? Yeah, so it can be EDP underscore markdown. It could also be a sub namespace, which is something I don't advertise very often um, because I didn't do this as a feature. It was more of a consequence um, that this works. But you can have EDP as your namespace, backslash, and then markdown module or Markdown as the uh, um, like second namespace, and then you can have your module class in there. And in your modules array, you can actually put EDP backslash mod, or Markdown. Um, so you can sub namespace your modules and have EDP as the top level. That said, if you do that, you're going to have a little bit of an issue with things like, remember what I told you earlier, toggling the layout based on which module is being loaded? And it takes that first namespace. It's going to think that those are both called EDP. Because that's like really the only way to find a module's name in Zen Framework 2 is that top level namespace. So you might break some assumptions that people might be making if you do that. I don't know. Um, App Agility, if you've used App Agility, um, it's a framework that came out for creating REST APIs. It's built on Zen Framework 2. Um, they do that. They have ZF, backslash, and then all of their App Agility modules. Um, they didn't ask me before they did that. <laughs> so. Um, Yeah, if he's talking about REST APIs, he's talking about App Agility. He's, this last year, been whoring App Agility. Like, <laughs> that's their main focus right now. Um, it's, it's actually really cool. So I, if you're creating a REST API, check out App Agility. It'll work with your ZF2 project, integrate really cleanly. It creates uh, a module for your API um, and everything. But yeah. OK, yeah. So the local Miami user group is going to have an App Agility talk by her, right? You're giving the talk. So um, yeah, so App Agility is really cool. But they do that sub namespacing thing. And in fact, they already ran into a bug with the autoloader like last week. And we had to patch Zen Framework um, because of the way they were doing those sub namespaces. Um, we had the standard autoloader loop through class names. And the first time it found a match, it would return false. Uh, or if, if the first time it found a, uh, 
or it got through checking and it didn't find a match, it would return false instead of continuing on for any other namespaces that were registered. So if you had two modules under the same namespace, that w one provided a class name that was uh, longer than the second module, provided a shorter class name that had like the same names leading up to it, um, it would get to the first one, not find a match, and fail there, so stop, instead of continuing on to, to find the actual match, something weird like that. So um, they're already seeing the, the kind of consequences of it not being designed for that use case. Um, but anyway, it works. So, um, so the second step is you're going to create a directory with the exact same name right? Um, that you just came up with. If you do a sub namespace, it's going to be two directories, like ZF and then another directory inside of that. Um, step three is to create a module.php. And this is, so who asked uh, what, how's too small for a module? Like, okay. This is the smallest module you can create in Zen Framework 2, pretty much. In fact, you could just call it A, and it would be a little bit smaller. Um, and you can use short tags, and it'd be a little bit smaller. Um, <laughs> so that's it. That, that's a perfectly valid module that will load. Uh, yes, okay, so it's too small for a useful module. It's like you've read these slides. Um, so the module class is the single entry point. That module right there is very, very not useful. It doesn't do anything besides consume an extra millisecond of your loading time. Um, but Zen Framework doesn't know anything besides that module class about your module. So it's the only requirement for a module. It's a single entry point for the framework into your module. Um, and you always put your module.php in the, the root of your module. There have been some people that have started putting it deeper in the SRC directory, which can work with Composer. Um, if you do that and open source it, you're going to get a pull request from me moving it back out <laughs> because it just bothers the crap out of me because what they do is they put a module.php still in the root that just includes the one that's nested deeper down. And I, like, my blood pressure rises when I open the one in the root and just see an include, and I'm like, God damn. And then I have to go down the, it's just really annoying. Don't do it. Everybody knows the module.php is in the root. Yeah, I don't know. Because it's like a purist thing. They want to follow PSR0 for everything. And so like they have to put it underneath that namespace folder. Uh, but I don't think it's worth it. So, All right. Uh, this is a real ZF2 module now. Um, this is probably my favorite module um, from like a novelty point of view. Uh, this is called EDP Markdown, and um, legitimately real module. Like you can go on GitHub; it's it's up. In fact, uh, the modules.zenframework.com site uses EDP Markdown to like display the readmes and stuff. Um, this is the entire module. The entire module is this one file, module.php. Um, so I did a hack here because Zen Framework doesn't care what you do with the module class; just the module class exists. So my module class is a view helper. I extended the abstract view helper, so I just made the class itself be the view helper. Um, there's a special method you can have called get view helper config, um, where you can return a service manager config and um, define your, your view helpers uh, and your service manager. So I'm basically here, I'm registering a view helper called markdown, and the view helper is this. It's this instance of this class which is already being created by the module manager, so it's no extra overhead to register it as a view helper. Um, so I've registered it as a view helper, and then all view helpers need to have an invoke method uh, in order to call them directly. So you can call it like this markdown and pass it a string. Uh, so the, Im the invoke method, and this is where I'm kind of cheating, is I'm using the PHP markdown library. Um, I'm doing a require once, so I don't have to do an if statement, because it only requires it the first time. Um, and they just have this function called markdown. Um, that takes a string, and that's it. That's the whole module, and it works. Um, so this is probably about as short as you can make a useful module that does something kind of productive. I've played around with the idea of trying to create a module, a Zen Framework 2 module that does something useful that can fit in a tweet, but I haven't succeeded yet. So if you're bored one day, you can help me with that. Problem is you're like down 40 characters just to like start the thing and get your first method in. PHP Markdown is, yeah, it's just a PHP library that's available somewhere. Um, oh, 
No. Yeah, PHP Markdown is, I don't know who wrote it. I found it on GitHub. It's like the main one that everybody uses. Um, yeah, so the module is only instantiated once, and um, when you pass it, we're going to talk about services, but the services key is saying, I want you to use literally this instance, this one single instance, as the helper. Um, so it won't try to create one or anything. It's going to use literally use this one that we passed it. It's much better um, than instantiating markdown over and over again. Yeah, oh, and yeah, this, um, yeah, so this isn't even a class. This is actually a function. Um, it has a capital M that's to do. I know. I don't ask. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't write the thing. Um, okay, so yeah, see how it's doing dir, and uh, this is kind of like what I told you not to do. Um, like, uh, it's not part of the module. This is actually a. I'm kind of cheating here. This is a z or a, a git submodule, is what it's called. Um, so I, we've got like a directory in this module. Let's see. I don't have. I'll just show you. EDP GitHub. So a submodule in Git. Oh, not EDP GitHub. Sorry, EDP Markdown. I have too many modules. All right. So um, module.php is the whole module, but right here you can see this. It's like a special kind of file. It's not a real folder. Um, this is a folder that ref references a, another Git repository on a specific commit. This was my hack around having to use Composer at the time. Um, the proper solution to this would be to um, have a composer.json file that references this library, which probably nowadays has composer.json. Let's see. Yeah, so uh, it has a composer file now, so we could actually include it with composer. Yeah, Composer would download it automatically and put it some in the vendor directory and, and handle it. And so you wouldn't need um, this git submodule. The thing is is that look, this is two years ago, so it didn't even have a Composer JSON file. Composer wasn't even really a thing then. So um, that's. Yeah, it's kind of part of the tree. Yeah, it's, it's, the file itself isn't there. This is just a reference. It's like a shortcut to another repository. But ultimately, yeah, it's not, it's not going to like work without that there. Like It has to be there, um, PHP Markdown. Yeah, that's a standard thing. We're going to talk about the service manager and these different keys. So what time is it, actually? What time does this end? Shit. All right. Um, <laughs> All right, so we just created an empty module. The next thing you need to do, like I said, the framework doesn't actually know about um, anything about the module until you tell it. So there's no assumptions. So auto-loading, you need to tell it, OK, I've got some classes, some PHP classes in here that um, need to be auto-loaded. And so there's uh, a method that you can add to your module class called git auto-loader config. If you've got a git auto-loader config, this is always the first method that gets called on your class. Um, for all intents and purposes. This, this is called first. Uh, there may or may not be a question on the certification exam about that. Um, git autoloader config is called first because before this is called, it's not really useful because you, even in your module class, you can't reference the other classes that your module might provide because it doesn't know how to autoload them yet. So git autoloader config, actually, you're just passing it an array um, of data and I don't have time to really explain how this works, but there's different types of autoloaders. There's class map and standard. Standard, you just do a key namespace and where it can find that name, anything under that namespace. You just, that's, that's all it is. Um, technically, if you use Composer for your module, you can scrap this method, and Composer actually takes care of figuring out the autoloading for you. Don't do it. Just leave this method in there so that you're not completely dependent on Composer. Um, so that was a standard autoloader. Your other options, you can do class maps, which just improve performance, um, add a little bit of overhead, because you have to not runtime overhead, but development overhead. You have to regenerate them, um, either as part of your build process or manually. Uh, and then also Composer. OK, so configuration. Um, 
Raphael Doms, when I first gave a tutorial, this was something he tweeted uh, during my tutorial. And uh, I thought it was kind of funny because it's partially true. Um, so configuration in Zen Framework 2, we started talking about how um, these are all merged into one. So I'm going to kind of go through this quickly. Um, but the most important thing is the order here that is what I want to go over. So the, um, the framework itself starts looping through the modules when it first loads. And so it's going to go to application. It's going to go to another module. And it's going to call the git config method on each of those. And it's going to be merging those into one big blob. And um, then after it's done doing that, it basically it does this in one loop, but I'm going to explain it in multiple loops. It basically loops through the modules again. And it has um, there are specific methods that can be called. There's git service config, uh, git view helper config. You saw in the view helper for this, like git view helper config. Um, these arrays actually get merged into the big config too, um, just under specific keys. So git view helper config is actually, this array is going to end up underneath the view underscore helpers key in the main big config. Um, so the first uh, loop through the modules calls git config and makes a big array out of that. And then the next loop basically calls git view helper config, git service config, and all those, and it holds those. And those get merged as well. So the order of the modules matters because um, if you set the same key in both of these modules, another module is going to win. It's going to override the value from the application module. Uh, and same with like get view helper config. If you had EDP markdown enabled here and then you had another module after that that d had a get view helper config method and defined a markdown view helper, the, the later one's going to win. It's going to use that view helper because it's all merged into one big array, and the later value wins. So you have all those. Um, then, and, and so far they're separate. Right? The git view helper config, git service configs, that's one blob. And the git config is another blob. So you need to, to kind of understand that. I know that's really screwing with you right now. I, hopefully it'll make more sense in a minute. Then we create a third blob of config, right? And that's from the autoload file. So we loop through all those and make a big blob. And then we take these three blobs that we have, and we merge them together. So we merge um, the uh, auto load, or no, it's the, uh, sorry, get view helper, get service config, all those, get merged in with the get configs as one. So those win. And then the config glob paths uh, get merged in on top of that. So those always win. Global and local will always win over anything that was defined in the module class. Question? Yeah, so if, yeah, if you wanted to include a, a module only in development, like Zen Developer Tools, um, that wouldn't work. Like You couldn't put it in the local.config file, because those are all merged later on after modules have already loaded, right? It's too late at that point. You're like, oh, crap, now what? Um, the solution to that is, what's this? It's a PHP file, right? What can you do in a PHP file? You can do logic, right? So people forget that. The application config files actually a PHP file. And so you don't have to have a return statement here. You can just set it as a variable. Um, and I've got, uh, I don't know if I have the example. I think I do have the example here. Uh, oh, yeah, let, we'll look at my next slide. Cool. Um, <laughs> so yeah, here, um, you can set like your environment variable, uh, application environment, whatever, and you can have like a modules array application. If the environment's development, you can add some developer tools, uh, then return your, your array at that point. Uh, that's really one of the reasons that it's a PHP file and not like an INI file or something, is so that you can do things like that. And that's perfectly valid. Um, so the next thing is you, you've got your git config methods, right? Um, that's what I said is the first thing that is kind of built into this blob. And um, the get config method just needs to return an array or a traversable object. There's no other rules for it. So what you do here in your get config method is entirely up to you. This is what you see 99.999% of the time. This, you'll just return include this directory slash config slash module.config.php. That's cool. 
If you don't like PHP file arrays, you like YAML, um, Zen Config supports YAML, so you can just use Zen Config, load the YAML files, and return that. Yeah, so there's a, you can do that. You can break them up so that it doesn't clutter up that file. The other solution to that is if you look at like spec catalog. Actually, one of my junior developers came up with this before I did. I'm a little ashamed of that. Um, if you go into a spec catalog and look at the config directory, you can see there's like module.config, there's module.config.routes, module.config.service manager. He's broken it up. He got annoyed that he was scrolling through this huge, huge array. And decided, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to split it up. And he did. And then you look at his uh, module file. And he's just got an array of the config files. He loops through them and merges them and returns the result. So uh, there's a million things you can do to, to um, improve things. You've got to just uh, remember that, like, the skeleton and what you see in these examples is just, like, bare bone basics, and you have a lot of flexibility um, to do your own thing, your own thing in framework too. So yeah, git config, it has to return an array or traversal. That's the only rule. So do whatever you want. You can even use Symfony's config loader. It doesn't matter. As long as you return something that it can loop through, it's happy. So config merging. Here's an example. We've got my module. It has a git config. And we have my module option with some value. And then we have an array value with foo, but this is an array. Um, so this is something that's really important. I don't think we're enough time to get to the services stuff, but I'm going to give you uh, the slides to my talk that does have that. So um, notice here we've got an array uh, uh, that's numerically indexed, right? It's, there's no keys. So what's the key for foo? Zero. Everybody knows that, right? Um, so here, let's say in config auto load global, we had array value and we had bar. This also has a key of zero, right? Um, if we were to have used array merge recursive, the PHP function, um, we would end up with a key of zero, and the value would be an array of foo bar, which is not what anybody would want or expect in this scenario. What you expect, right, is the result to be an array of foo and bar, just right here. Um, so there's also a function in PHP called array replace recursive. Um, array replace recursive kind of works, except it sees two keys of zero, and it says, oh, we've got conflicting values for this key. I'm going to replace it. So you'd only get bar in that case. Uh, so neither of those worked. So we had to create the array utils merge function that we have in Zen Framework 2 that does kind of like what you would expect um, in this scenario. So that's something to keep in mind is that we do have a special array merging function. Um, and so in this case, where you have things like this, um, that'll be merged together. The result that you get is something like this. Um, so you have array value foo and bar uh, get merged together. That's the actual config. Yeah, everything. And you saw that, because right, we had my module get config, and then we had this from autoload global. It doesn't really matter where they came from. This could be from the get config of another module or a local config file anywhere. It doesn't matter that your result's going to be the same. So um, there's also a feature in Zen Framework 2. If you want to unset, it's really easy to override and change and add, but unsetting something that a module sets is kind of annoying. Um, we do have a feature for it, but you have to use the event manager. So you have to grab the event manager. Um, you attach a listener to this event merge config event. Um, and so in this case, I'm just saying, I want you to run my on merge config method um, of this class whenever this happens. All right? And so this is what that actually looks like. This is further down that class. On merge config. Um, what we're going to do is we, from the config listener, and you just have to trust me on this, um, what that is, uh, you can pull the git merge config, or you can pull the merge config out of it. That is the big blob, right? That is the, the merge config right there. You can do anything you want to it. Mutate it in any way, unset, add crap to it at that point. Um, this is after merging has happened. Um, and then you can reset it. You can just put it back after you've changed it. And this is at the very moment after config merging is done, but before anything actually uses the merged config, before it gets set into the service manager, before it any, it's available anywhere else. Um, this is like your moment to do whatever you want to change without um, anything really knowing that you've got in there. 
the here. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, so that is to get it back as an array. Um, it forces it to be converted to an array. It can be technically like a Zen config object, and um, that's just a flag to say I want I want to get the array, not the Zen config object. Uh, internally, it converts everything to uh, arrays, so there's really no config objects. But you could technically have returned a config object from one of the get config methods, and it holds on to that. Um, it's kind of complicated. I don't want to get too much into the internals, but that just basically says give me an array, not anything else. Yeah. Um, all right. So, I'll do a little quiz here, because this is this is probably one of the most important things you can get out of this, because there's really no good place in the documentation to get this. It's just experimenting, and I'm going to give it to you straightforward. Um, so let's say we have a module, has a get config method, some value is module. We're going to use this key everywhere for all these. So we have some value is module. This is local.php, some value is local. This is global.php, some value is global. So we have all three of these in our application. So when we dump the merge config and look at some value, what's it actually end up being? Which one of these? Two, the one that was in the module, so that'd be one. Two, mixed mixed answers. So the answer is um, not on the next slide. Uh, the answer is local uh, because the module ones are merged first, but it's later things that get merged that override those, right? And so later on, you have um, global and local that get merged into that. But remember, local always overrides global because of that glob pattern. If you were to switch those two in the glob pattern, you would actually reverse that order. Um, so it's kind of a trick question because this depends on you using the default skeleton application. It's not like really the framework that makes that order happen. Um, it's just the defaults that happen to be set in the skeleton. That sucked writing the ZF2 certification exam because <laughs> I'd write questions and I'd have to be like, well, that's kind of the answer, but only if they're using the skeleton application defaults. So I struggled with that one. So a lot of the questions were like, in the default skeleton application, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Um, here's another thing is configuration caching. Um, it's, it's kind of a lot of steps, right, for every request to be looping through every module, calling get config, merging all these values. Um, it's a little heavy. So you can cache that whole thing and skip all of it. So it just do doesn't even do any work, um, doesn't call get config. It just, once it has that merged result, it's just going to serialize it and put it in the file, and the next time it's just going to load that array. Um, except for closures, thank you for mentioning that. That's the next. Um, Thing that I was going to say. So those other methods, those get service config, get view helper config, you saw that I did um, with the EDP markdown. And remember, I, I explained that this gets actually kind of merged in with the rest of the config, but under a specific key. What happens if you have something like this in an array and you try to serialize it or uh, like you know convert it to a string? It's not going to work very well. You can't put like an instance of something. Um, and, and serialize that out. It's not gonna, gonna behave properly. Same thing if you have like a closure, um, an anonymous function sitting there in that array, it's not gonna work. That is the only reason that these methods exist. The get view helper config, get service config, it's to allow you to define things underneath those service configurations um, that are not cacheable, that can't be serialized. Uh, everything else can just be returned from get config. You're, if, if we had uh, this being an invocable, and unfortunately we're not going to get to the services um, part of this, but if this was an invocable and we had here a string class name, which is something you can do, in that case it'll just create a new instance of it the first time you grab it. Um, that would be cacheable. Right? You can serialize that array. That's just a string key and a string value. If you were to serialize that, it'd be all perfect. Um, so in that case, you could just return it from git config. And That'd be fine. It could be cached. This cannot be um, cached. So you should only put things in these methods that cannot be cached. That's uh, either closure or something like that. That's this is a really weird edge case. So uh, you don't normally do dollar this. It's usually closures. You get around using, uh, in yes. So you, in, where your factories un, underneath your factories. Um, which is the part I'm not going to get to. You normally have a key here called factories, and then you have a name, and then you have a closure with the code to create that object. Um, 
instead of putting the closure with the code there, you can put the string to a class name that is the factory that has the create service method. That's what we saw with uh, fly contact. He had done that. Um, then you can just have that in your config, and it can be cached because it's just scalar strings, and everything's fine. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. These do not get cached. It actually does call those methods every time for every request. Um, so it caches the config without these values. And then it actually does a little bit of magic to like, it, it pulls the cached values out into a temporary variable, puts this value in, and then reapplies them so that those cache values actually still override in the correct order. Um, that's some magic you don't need to know about, but just know that even though they're not cached, the configuration merging order still applies properly. Um, Yeah, so if you have a closure and you t enable configuration caching, it will work on your first request, and then the second request it's going to fail um, and say you can't, can't deserialize whatever the, the error is. It's actually, we use var exports, so it's a different error. But um, All right, so I'm going to, what time is it? Four o'clock, all right, so yeah, we're out of time, I guess. Um, I'm going to go over some configuration tips. Uh, real quick to, to kind of wrap it up. Um, your git config methods of your modules put some sane defaults there. Like all the defaults that it kind of needs to work, um, put them there. And, and the values that you want it to use if they haven't been explicitly set. Um, then you can use global and local um, dist files uh, for just easy configuration, especially for open source modules, but even for yourself, just for later. Consider yourself like six months down the road trying to reinstall this module. Um, you know, develop it that way. And so providing a disk file that shows all the keys that you need to actually set up to get this module to work um, is a really helpful thing to yourself, especially if it's open source, but even if it's not. Um, local, obviously, for environment-specific stuff. Global, for anything that is application-specific, if that makes any sense. So it's, um, you know, it applies to the application uh, in all environments. That you can sho shove it in the, the global config file, and then um, always enable configuration caching in production. There's no reason not to have configuration caching turned on in production. Um, absolutely no reason. Uh, always turn it on. Uh, just make sure that as part of your build process or something that you delete the cache file, because there's no mechanism in Zen Framework 2 to invalidate the configuration cache. So the way to invalidate it is just to RM the file, delete, delete the file, um, and then it'll just build it the next time. Um, and then avoid config key conflicts um, if you can. And there's obviously going to be intentional config key conflicts. That's OK. That means you decided to override something. Um, but avoid like kind of like just incidental config key conflicts. You don't want to accidentally just um, be, be overriding stuff. And what I mean by that is like you saw with fly contact, he had things like a, a mail underscore transport key, right? But that was underneath a top-level array key called fly contact. So that's not going to conflict with any other module. Right? So consider doing that. Like any specific config keys for your, app, for your module, um, nest it underneath um, a top-level config key so that it's not going to conflict. And then I did want to show um, a tip real quick, if nobody minds me going over. Um, this is on my blog. So I showed how to load a specific module in a, um, like, development environment. But you can also, uh, do this. So this is application.config.php. Uh, my blog is not very friendly to zooming. Um, and this config log paths, it's an array, right? So you can add more paths for it to autoload config files. So what I've done here is I've added another one underneath autoload. And I am loading anything dot the application environment that might be staging, um, production, development, whatever. Um, and then uh, I default it to production and then dot PHP. So that allows you to kind of do the old style, uh, Zen Framework 1 style, of having sections. They're, they're different files instead of chunks in your I, I and I block. Um, 
but that, that allows you to do it. And if you want the cascading thing, you can actually just make a list. You can do like production comma, development comma, whatever, or testing comma, development. So you can actually still have the cascading effect of the values as well. Um, if you read this blog post, I recommend that you don't do this, but there are some people that just don't care what I have to say about that and just want the old style of doing it. Um, so I at least made it available. Um, so more of this blog post is about convincing you to do it the right way. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, there's that. I think that's pretty much everything. The, there's just the, the only slides that we are really going to skip are, uh, and we didn't get to the Cards Against Humanity, but I'll probably do that at the hackathon or something. So come to the hackathon. Um, is I wanted to talk about the different uh, services. But don't fret, because I actually wrote a blog post that's just as good. So, which isn't something I would advertise at the beginning of my talk, but now that I'm short, um, I'll, uh, I'll tell you. So if you go to my uh, blog, I'll find the actual introduction to the Zen Framework 2 Service Manager. So um, this blog post talks about everything that those remaining slides has, which is just the different types of services, what a factory is, what an invocable is, what a um, uh, abstract factory is, and so on. So um, those are all really good to know. I highly recommend that everybody do spend some, even if you've used factories and stuff, uh, spend some time read this, um, learn about abstract factories, learn about some of the other things that maybe um, you're not fully fully uh, aware of. So, um, all right. So it is. It does end at four, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So we yeah we didn't have time. That was the next exercise. But uh, here's the answer. Is uh, I'll give you that. There's a module called Asset Manager. Uh, it's written by I don't know how to say his last name, but um, it's just called Asset Manager. He didn't follow my naming recommendation of a prefix, uh, which kind of bothers me. But the module itself is actually really good. Um, you install this module. Uh, you just clone it in there, and, or install with Composer, actually. It's a little bit better. Uh, and then just like with view script paths in Zen Framework 2, you register each module needs to provide a view script path, and you put that in its config. And you say, OK, dot, dot, slash views, or whatever, is where my views are. Um, with this module, you do the same thing, but with public directory. You say, hey, I'm providing a public directory that has CSS and images and stuff. And you just tell it, each module tells it where the public directory is. And what's going to happen is it listens to the 404 event. So basically it says, OK, a request came in. We don't have anything that matches. And this module kicks in and says, OK, I'm going to loop through these public directories and find if there's any file that matches the, the path that was requested. If there is, it will, and this is only for development, um, load the contents of the file, get the MIME type, and feed that through PHP so that your browser sees it. Um, and that allows you to access those resources without them actually being in the public directory of the web server, you don't never want to do that in production. That's terrible to tie up PHP processes to feed through static um, files. So it also has a thing to cache them into the public directory. Um, so it just copies them over as soon as it finds a match. It copies it into the actual public directory. The next request just gets the file from the web server. So this integrates with the setup as well. So if you want to, at the same time, minify your CSS or do other cool things, um, this can do all of that. I haven't really played with that so much. Um, I tend to have that as part of my build process, but a lot of people like to do it with aesthetic, um, which is pretty cool. Um, so you can do all that kind of stuff. You can minify your JS or your CSS. You can compile less if you write all your CSS with less. Um, all that works with Asset Manager. No, no, yeah. It's if if you turn on caching, then it's great in production. Um, slows down. So there's that. Um, I told him to add a CLI like thing to so you can build it. All right, so, sorry, I'm going over. Um, and I don't know if he ever did. I, I'd have to check again to see if that ever got added. There's all. Oh, you wrote. There you go. So beautiful. Um, there's also Bacon Asset Loader. I haven't used this one, so that's why I don't recommend it. Um, 
I'm not saying it's bad. I just I have, haven't used it, so I don't know that it's good. Um, but this one does have a command line. Um, this, it does the exact same thing. Uh, it, I don't think it integrates with aesthetic, but it does the other stuff. Um, but here you can see you just run on the command line, bake an asset loader, publish asset public, and it pushes all the assets there. Um, you can have that as part of your build process. So. Oh, cool. Thanks. Um, all right, that's it. So I'm going to leave you with this. And um, please ask that you provide feedback. Um, that helps all of us become better. If you have feedback on, on what we, I can do to improve it or what I did right also is helpful. Um, and I mean, this, this feedback is really invaluable. Um, it's what, what allows conferences to pick the right talks and um, the right people to come out here. So please uh, write down that number. It's on joined.n. And uh, yeah, give feedback. Let me know what you thought uh, of the tutorial. And don't come to my talk tomorrow. <laughs> so thanks.